practice. Uh, thank you for raising that. Uh, the next item uh, of business, or items of business, are motions to approve a total of five statutory rules, all of which relate to the health protection regulations. There will be a single debate on all five motions. Just for members, a single debate on all five motions. I will ask the clerk to read the first motion, then call on the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on all of the motions as listed on the order paper. When all who wish to speak have done so, I shall put the question on the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record, and I will call the minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. This process will be repeated for each of the remaining statutory rules. If that is clear, I shall proceed. Clark, could you read the first motion, please? That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister, for Health, Minister of Health to move the motion. Moved. Thank you, uh, Minister. The, the Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate. I call on the Minister to open the debate on the motions, please. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as you have indicated, there are five motions before the Assembly today. and With your permission, I will address each of these in my opening remarks. I will begin by outlining for members the changes brought about by these regulations. So I will begin with the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Regulation Northern Ireland 2020. At the conclusion of the fifth review of the need for the restrictions on requirements in the health protection regulations, the Executive agreed that a fresh set of regulations should be made for the purpose of retaining those restrictions and requirements that were considered still to be necessary, and clarifying powers for the imposition of new restrictions should the need arise. The subsequent No. 2 regulations were then made on the 23rd of July. They revoked and replaced the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, including all previous amendments that were being made to them. The restricted regulation required the closure of certain businesses, services and premises listed in the schedule, except for limited, limited permitted use. The regulation imposed restrictions on gatherings, both indoor and outdoor, of more than 30 people, which were not permitted to take place except for gatherings organised or operated for cultural, entertainment, recreational, outdoor sports, social community, educational, work, legal, religious or political purposes, where the organiser or operator of the gathering undertakes a risk assessment and complies with the relevant guidance to limit virus transmission. The regula regulation also imposed restrictions on gatherings in private dwellings, which, which outdoors were to be of no more than 30 people and indoors were to be no more than 10 people from no more than four different households. The regulations are required to be reviewed every 28 days, with the first review taking place by the 21st of August. The regulations are due to expire after six months, which will be the 23rd of January 2021. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, now moving on to the second motion listed before the members. Uh, the Executive has been clear from the start that our response to COVID-19 is informed strongly by the advice we receive from the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor, with health protection at its heart. In line with that, and considering the arguments for and against use of face coverings by the general public, the Executive agreed to the introduction of a mandatory requirement for passengers on public transport to wear face coverings. This requirement was brought into effect on 10 July by way of an amendment to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. The Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 were then made on 23 July. These regula regulations replicated exactly the face coverings provisions in the original coronavirus restriction regulations as amended, so that they sat outside and alongside the new coronavirus restriction No. 2 regulation, which was made at the same time. They require members of the public subject to limited exceptions to wear a face covering on public transport. The regulations are required to be reviewed within six months, which is by January 2021, and are due to expire after 12 months, which takes us to July 21. In light of the evolving evidence and proposals to relax restrictions in relation to indoor interactions and the pausing of shielding, 
The executive subsequently agreed to introduce the use of face coverings in indoor settings where interactions with individuals from other households take place. The Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 were made then on the 31st of July and were commenced on the 10th of August by way of a commencement order which was made on the 7th of August. The Face Coverings Amendment Regulations require members of the public, subject to limited exceptions, to wear a face covering whilst in an inside relevant place, focusing on settings uh, where there is retail sale of goods or services, including in a shop or shopping centre. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Executive set up a cross-departmental working group on entertainment issues to address the risks associated with certain activities taking place, such as singing and dancing, the effects of loud music, outdoor larger event management, uh, and the group has discussed the situation for the arts sector, and the Department of Communities proposed that theatres and concert halls be allowed to reopen for the purposes of rehearsal and live recordings without audiences. This would also enable staff to return to work, and the Executive agreed to this proposal. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 were then made on 7 August. The two main changes were introduced were allow a theatre or a concert hall to be used solely for a rehearsal of live recording in both cases without an audience from the 8th of August and to permit sports and indoor arenas not capable of seating 5,000 or more spectators from the 10th of August. The Executive was mindful from the start of the COVID pandemic of the impact on family ties and social interactions. This is why the Executive gradually eased arrangements for gatherings within domestic settings. However, in response to the rise in cases since July, and due to the particular transmission risks associated with people gathering in these settings, the Executive agreed to reduce the number of people who could meet in domestic and garden settings. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Health Protection Coronavirus No. 2 Amendment No. 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 were made on 25 August. In summary, the main changes that have been introduced by these regulations and amendments is to reduce the maximum number who could participate in an indoor or outdoor gathering, not in a private dwelling from 30 to 15 people with some exceptions, to reduce the maximum number who could participate in an outdoor gathering at a private dwelling from 30 people to 15 people, to reduce the maximum number who could participate in an indoor gathering in a private dwelling from 10 people from four households to six people from two households, and to permit up to 10 people to attend a wedding or civil partnership ceremony indoors in a private dwelling where one of the participants is terminally ill. The restrictions on gatherings and those in relation to private dwellings do not apply to a funeral or wake, but those involved must comply with the guidance issued by the Department of Health. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is in the nature of these debates um, that I take the opportunity to outline some of the further changes that have been agreed since the regulations that are subject to the motions being debated today. In previous debates, members have raised concerns about the time lag between the Executive making decisions and the opportunity for the Assembly to hear and debate those. I am taking the opportunity today then to update the Assembly on decisions recently made by the Executive. These have included decisions on soft play areas, which have been allowed to open from the 13th of September, introduction of local restrictions on the 6th of September, 16th of September in protected areas which were specifically defined by postcodes and confirmation on the 21st of September of an executive decision to allow wet pubs to open with effect from the 20th of September. Given the ongoing rise in cases that we have seen over the past few days, the executive agreed yesterday that it is now necessary to widen the local restrictions to cover the whole of Northern Ireland. And Mr Deputy Speaker, this will take effect from 6 p.m. this evening. The executive is keeping all options open, especially now that we are at a critical juncture and need to act quickly to try to bring the rate of transmission down. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the regulations to the Assembly. I call Colum Gildenew, the Chair of the Health Committee, to speak. Mark New and Kushta Slancha and Kubriel Reiktaki are on the 10th of September. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. We considered, as a committee, all five of these statutory rules on the 10th of September. Uh, there is an unfortunate irony, I suppose, to discussing today the relaxation to restrictions announced so recently, even as we have, are aware now of the change in direction that is now required to tackle the, the current rise in cases. Nevertheless, it is important, I think, to put on record the Committee's scrutiny of the regulations under debate. Key issues from compliance to enforcement and communication require consideration, whatever the nature and level of restrictions. And we hope that discussions to date can inform the forthcoming regulations and their implementation. The Chief Environmental Officer summarised their content and reminded the Committee that the short time frame for bringing the SRs into force resulted from the need to ensure that restrictions are only in place for as long as is strictly necessary. Turning first to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 regulations as amended, the Committee had previously acknowledged the complexity of the previous coronavirus restrictions, which had become a lengthy list of exceptions to the general restriction on leaving home. The Committee heard that the newly restructured regulations as amended revoke the previous restrictions and provide instead a list of businesses, services and premises that are required to remain closed. In addition, we were advised that the review period for these regulations is 28 days. We discussed the range of, option, of purposes for which a gathering may be arranged subject to certain conditions. On inquiring what was excluded from the apparently very wide-ranging list of permitted purposes for a gathering, the CEHO advised us that the, this approach has been taken to confirm what was permissible given the revocation of previous restrictions. He highlighted that these provisions require an organiser to conduct a risk assessment if numbers exceed those specified. Committee members conveyed a degree of frustration on the part of the public in trying to keep up with frequent changes and understand the rationale for certain rules. People have found it hard, for example, to fathom why it was safe to go to a restaurant where, they could be where there could be large numbers of people, but not safe for one person to visit a relative in their home at a certain point. The Chief Environmental Health Officer stated that there was evidence that gatherings in homes present a greater risk. Possibly since business environments were subject to guidance and various measures which make them less risky, whereas behaviour in our homes tend to be more relaxed, and we all know that. When we go into our own family homes, we touch many more surfaces, we, we put on the kettle, we open the cupboard to find, to find things, and that is, that is, there is evidence that this is causing uh, further spread. The public messaging on this is so important and is a matter to which we will no doubt return. Public understanding will be key to sustaining support for the rules in the coming months. The CEO, CEHO also confirmed that the regulations are kept under constant review and that renewed efforts were being made to bring all the guidance together in one place on NA Direct, which is a welcome step. Further to question around arrangements for funerals, the CEHO confirmed that funerals had been taken out of the regulations and were subject instead to detailed statutory guidance which had been developed through significant engagement with stakeholders to seek to address the sensitivities in this matter. This distinction in terms of what is covered by the legislation versus guidance or statutory guidance arose in discussion on face coverings. The Director of Public Health advised that the regulations require face coverings on public transport in shops, in shopping centres and in shopping centres subject to exemptions. In other outdoor, indoor spaces, face coverings are strongly advised in guidance where a two metre distance cannot be maintained. Staff working in a shop are not required specifically to wear face coverings, but employers may decide that that is necessary. In our discussion on 10th of September, the issue of student accommodation was already a worry and the serious concern of permanent residents were put to officials, as well as the risks associated with large student houses, both for the students and for their families, if they return home at weekends. The Environmental Health Officer confirmed that there were no specific regulations in development to address student accommodation at that time, because each house or apartment becomes a student's residential address for the purpose of the regulations, which apply equally to such houses and should be adhered to. The committee has asked to be kept updated on the working group, which has been established to work through all of those issues. Having inquired about the requirements in respect of risk assessments for certain gatherings, the CEHO emphasised that the department's guidance would direct an organiser to consider the potential risks depending on the nature of the gathering and put reasonable measures in place to address that, such as provision for hand washing, one-way systems, etc. 
He advised that the health and safety website has a template to assist. Uh, the CEHO could not, on that occasion, provide detail in respect of the application of risk assessment in school settings, but confirmed that the CMO and the Chief Scientific Advisor were working with the education sector on that. We also explored the levels of public compliance with regulations and their enforcement. A degree of concern was expressed about low levels of mask wearing in certain settings, such as petrol stations, though positive views were expressed about compliance in retail settings more generally. And I think we have all witnessed that, where people appear to, um, where they're doing the big shop, they have the mask on, but where they're popping in and out to, to pick something up, and that presents a risk that we, we all should be conscious of. In respect of compulsory face, use of face coverings, the Director of Public Health acknowledged that the list of exceptions was wide but expressed the view that this approach, encouraging personal judgment, was more likely to be successful in driving up compliance rates rather than seeking to be more prescriptive. She also confirmed that visors are not regarded as face coverings for the purpose of the legislation. The committee noted that there is provision both for a fixed penalty notice and court proceedings which could lead to a fine at level five on the standard scale. The Chief Environmental Health Officer advised us that these different provisions were there to provide options for the PSNA for lesser and more serious breaches, although their approach remained to advise and encourage adherence before moving to enforcement. The committee requested further information on enforcement of the regulations to date, and perhaps the Minister can say a little more about that in his closing remarks. In closing my remarks as Chair, Mr Deputy Speaker, I can confirm that despite concerns raised, the committee agreed to support confirmation of the regulations. We look forward to ongoing engagement with the department to ensure that we respond promptly and proportionately on an evidence-led basis to the challenges ahead, and that change, and that change is communicated effectively throughout the community. I would like now, last uh, Coyle, Coyle, to make a few remarks in my role as Sinn Féin spokesperson for health. I have to say that we do understand that these are unprecedented times and extremely challenging times, and we would normally, I don't think any of us in this House, consider regulations and powers such as these, but they are necessary. We need to keep in mind that individuals and communities are directly affected. They, they're affected with bereavement, they're affected with struggling with restrictions, and lack of potential work and opportunities and threats to business and all of those concerns, and we are all conscious of that. Although the regulations that we are discussing today came into force a while ago, we are still seeing a need for, for regulation and a need that is proportionate and measured. It has been said before, but it is worth noting that these regulations have since been amended and overtaken by other regulations, but it is important that we reflect fully on them today. So, Tasagin Kaje na Hebrian and Skiaru Socialda, Nida Lava, we know what works. It's the COVID basics social distancing, washing your hands and good respiratory hygiene. We know that this can impact the spread of the virus in a, in a positive way. Face coverings make a plea. Uh, face coverings, um, I would, I would uh, encourage everyone out there to try to remember to wear a face mask. Um, the wearing a face covering is, is more productive than not wearing one, and I think that is something that we all can do for ourselves and for each other. We also need to keep in mind that when this assembly int introduces restrictions and duties, it must also provide support, whether that be providing masks or supporting the delivery of vital public services. I am conscious today also of the situation in relation to uh, Daisy Hill Hospital and the situation that we have seen in Craigavon area hospitals. We have very many frontline workers out there working every day to fight and to deal with this virus. They deserve our support and encouragement. Hospitals are settings which are dealing with COVID cases, and we, we, uh, we, do, we are worried for them, but we also are uh, supportive that they, that they have the equipment and the guidance and principles and policies that they need to protect themselves and their patients. So I suppose it's one thing to put in place restrictions and the means to enforce them. However, it is, it is sometimes more difficult to provide a comprehensive system of support. I believe that our response should be led by public health, and I welcome any cooperation between the health agencies and the PSNA that emphasise that message. Finally, we could all very easily get stuck into the details and the exemptions, but it is important, I think, that we keep in mind the very real and lasting impact that these regulations have on members of the public, but also we also need to bear in mind the risk of potential further spread of the virus and work together to do what we can about that.
Call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And it's useful at the outset to, to have um, had that more technical commi um, committee scrutiny detailed um, this morning uh, by the committee chair, so I've no intention of, of repeating what's already been said. Um, we've come a long way since the last um, time we progressed regulations through this House, and I do think it's worth reflecting on some aspects of the journey that we've been on in recent times. I want to first and foremost pay tribute to our school children and school leaders and staff. It's been a difficult six months, but I think as a society, we all felt uh, that little bit of normality had resumed when we saw the kids walking to school with their school bags on and seeing all those first day photographs on, on social media of all the children in their, in their fresh uniforms. And our prayers for their safety and that, that they, can, they can get caught up on the um, valuable time that has been lost to them in their education and of course enjoy the um, company of their classmates. Obviously for our business community this remains a challenging time and I think specifically of those who operate wet bars and soft play areas and indeed those in our arts, travel, tourism and hospitality sectors. We do need to look at what we can and what we can ask our government at Westminster to do to support these industries as we, as we know that in the short term for many, the difficulties of recent times is not going to ease. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to mention one specific area of these regulations and of the current situation. There has been much focus on the so-called lockdown of certain areas, and from today that will apply to all of Northern Ireland. This is not lockdown. I know this is a source of great frustration for people, and I would urge the Minister to do all that he can to evidence the need for the restrictions to the public and also to ensure that they are lifted at the earliest possible opportunity. They must not go any further than is absolutely necessary. I welcome the alliance within a family of six living under one roof to be allowed to meet with a smaller number of people from one other household. Children aged 12 and under with evidence that they are rarely transit, they rarely transit the disease, being discounted from that party of six figure is the right move and we ought to not discriminate against large families and adopt similar common sense approach as has been the case in Scotland. I would also ask the Minister to confirm today that households may bubble with one other uh, to make clear what that means in practice and not uh, that it's just not for those who live alone but for example my ability to bubble with my parents. Adherence to these guidelines is vital if we are to combat this disease and its spread. So we need to work with people as much as possible and where common sense can apply, we ought to apply it. This asks a lot of people who are already very weary, who crave normality and who are worried about family, finances and futures. If we are expecting the public at large to adhere to these guidelines, then we must see those who breach them dealt with by the rule of law. The flaunting of the law, whether it's by the Deputy First Minister at the Story Funeral, by triumphant GAA supporters invading a pitch in Dungannon, or students who believe they know better parting in the Holy Lands. The public are watching to see that the law is enforced, and failure to do so will further erode public adherence to these rules, just as these scandalous events have done. Mr Deputy Speaker, as the Minister, the Chief Scientific Officer and the Chief Medical Officer have stated, we are facing a key period once again in the fight against COVID-19. Whilst prioritising this battle, we must not lose sight of the need to keep Northern Ireland open, to keep our health service open, to keep our businesses open, keep our society open as much as we possibly can. And that is a fine balance and not an easy one. I urge the public to continue to follow the guidance if we all do our bit, we can stave off the worst this virus can do to our community, both in terms of victims, but wider societal harm. Thank you. Here, Mr. Colin McGrath, on can I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, coronavirus, as we all know, remains within the, our community with spikes moving up and down. It is quite clear from the past few weeks that the current trajectory is upwards and that this will eventually result, if unchecked, uh, in, in to too many people contracting the virus and thus maybe needing hospitalisation and for some maybe some ICU intervention. And we know from our past experiences that this will result in people dying. I do not envy the job of the executive ministers in trying to manage the response to this virus. 
um, although it increasingly uh, appears that we have only one minister uh, in responding to these issues. Uh, I do wonder if the First and Deputy First Minister are now hiding because they can't agree on the message that they need to be sending out. Um, and that was certainly evident to anybody that listened to the radio this morning. The regulations that we have been presented with uh, uh, up to this stage are being tabled are, are very complex. Uh, they are confusing and at times they are contradictory by the time they make it here to the Assembly and they are grouped together. And this always, always makes it a very difficult message to sell to the community. Um, this is amplified by the fact that many of the regulations that we're talking about here today uh, and presented with will be out of date by six o'clock tonight, uh, whenever the new uh, rules and regulations come in. And I kind of use the, the, the regulations that come in, the Portugal example, where one of the regulations presented says that it's okay to go to Portugal, and then there's another one that came in about two weeks later that said, no, it's not okay to go to Portugal, and we know the ramifications and we know the impact that that has had on our constituents that were caught whenever they were over there. Mr Deputy Speaker, every time I have taken to my feet in this place to discuss these regulations, I have said that the matter of clarity is critical, because lack of clarity means a lack of certainty. When is the message going to get through that we need to have the clear and simple messaging? The bottom line is that the communication strategy from the executive is not working. The public are left to try and understand what these regulations mean, how they should interpret them, about when they can or cannot hug their grandchildren, or when they can or cannot stay with people during birth. Uh, and they are not embracing them because there is so often a change to them and that they do not like that. So I would ask if the Minister could give us an update on the communication strategy specifically that there is from the Executive to punch out the message in a clear and unequivocal way. And I do accept that this has probably been transferred to him in the last few days uh, rather than where it was previously being carried out. As I say, the lack of clarity means lack of certainty. And, and I'll give you an example, Mr Deputy Speaker, on that. When the announcement was made to the press yesterday, and I say that the announcement was made to the press and not to this House, as the Speaker had suggested last week, and I do note, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I think when it came to yesterday that the First and the Deputy First Minister and the Health Minister were all present here in this House and that we were actually sitting when the announcements were being made. Um, but when the announcement was made yesterday, I posted, as I to try and be helpful for constituents and, as all MLAs would have undoubtedly done, posted on social media a little snapshot of exactly what the new regulations and the changes were. And at the point of preparing for this debate this morning, I have just short of 200 comments on that thread. And those 200 comments are not positive. And in fact, it actually has almost shocked me that, to a T, they are not positive. I can understand it being peppered with a, an unhappy comment here or a, a disputed comment there, but it is comment after comment after comment of people that do not like the regulations, do not want to see the regulations, or are totally confused and at points exasperated by the regulations that are being brought in. And there are comments that ask things like, I can't have people in my house, but I can take them to the bar. Uh, how does this work with so many children in my classroom? Or as one constituent summed it up, there needs to be a simple go-to place for the most up-to-date guidance. Each day something new is said and wires are getting crossed causing confusion. I appreciate the complexities of what's going on, but these announcements leave it open to individual interpretation. Mr Deputy Speaker, as MLAs, we have done our job in delivering this message to the public based on the messaging that we are presented with. But again, I ask, how are we meant to sell this message when it is so unclear? How can we ever expect the public to adhere to something that is unclear, confusing and open to interpretation? The public are rightly frustrated and they are rightly angry. It is becoming increasingly frustrating to have to say time after time that when decisions are taken by the executive, we end up with 200 comments on social media streams asking what does this mean for their day-to-day -day life. But how do we find out about this information when we have to wait 
28 days before the regulations come here to the floor of the Assembly. Mr Deputy Speaker, what I'm about to say, I don't say with any sense of satisfaction or enjoyment. The problem with simply going to the media could not have been more illustrated clearly this morning when not two hours ago our First and Deputy First Minister took to the radio separately, with one giving their interpretation of the new regulations and the other giving their interpretation 30 minutes later. Now, I know it's still early in the day, but I'm sure by the end of it we might see one of the party's MPs giving a further interpretation of those guidelines with their expert views on the matter. But it's sufficient to say that the First and Deputy First Minister were all over the place this morning. I think, Mr Deputy Speaker, if the public are asking relevant and appropriate questions of their representatives, which they are, it is high time that we got the opportunity to ask those questions here in this room from the dispatch boxes. And I welcome, I absolutely welcome that it's the Health Minister that will be taking on that role, because as we have had evidence here today, prepared to stand up and give a bit of clarity and get a bit of information to us that we can ask those questions. We weren't able to get it from the First and Deputy First Minister. I hope that we will continue to get it from the Minister for Health. So finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a plethora of regulations presented to us today, and in their own time and in their own way, they were logical. I continue to support the decisions that are being taken in the interests of public health, but the issue of clarity, the issue of understanding, the issue of interpretation seriously needs addressed. And if the Health Minister can answer any of the questions that I've raised today, especially around the messaging, it would be very, very welcome. Thank you. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I welcome the Health Minister here today um, uh, when he, as he brings these uh, SRs, as we call them, and these regulations before the Assembly. But what I would say is that uh, when he was Chief Whip and Leader, I saw less of him than you guys are seeing him in this chamber. And I don't say that to, to raise a smile, I say that because he seems to be. The, the, the Executive Minister, not only with the, the biggest portfolio, but certainly with the biggest responsibility which has been thrust upon him uh, once again by, by the deflection of some of the work, I think, by TEO. I thank Mr McGrath for some of his comments with regard to that, because let's get real, people, this is a crisis of monumental proportions, as was laid out uh, at the start of this pandemic by the Health Minister. Um, and, and these restrictions are, are, are somewhat old, and whilst I will refer to them, because the Speaker will hold me to task if I don't, um, it is important that we get our act together here, not just in this Assembly, but indeed the Executive. The, 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 the days for petty squabbling can be kept to another day, guys, because the very lives of the people across Northern Ireland depend on the leadership of the people within this chamber, whether you're an Executive Minister or whether you're an MLA. Because people follow our example, regardless of what they say on Facebook and Twitter and on the news and, uh, and the public beating that we take at times. Really, they do watch and they do act on what we do, and not on what we say at times. To turn to some of the regulations, um, I think we do a discredit and a disservice to the population across Northern Ireland uh, in their adherence to many of the rules and regulations that have been meted down to us, in particular uh, face coverings. Because, let's be honest, as, as has been said, sometimes it may be uh, conflicting to read and interpret some of the, the regulations. I find it okay and I find through my office I'm able to answer many of those questions. But one of the problems that, that we face today in 2020 is, is the threat of fake news. The, 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 the postings that are on Facebook and are available on the internet, when you even do a search yourself, sometimes it's almost impossible um, to, to find the right information. Um, and it's very believable. I have stuff shared with me, and I'm sure uh, as members you have people send you uh, items which look like regulations and look like advice and could even be stumped, but actually they're desperately dangerous. And I think that Facebook and Twitter have a, ha, at this time, just like us, they make enough money out of it, have a role to play in cleaning up their act and making sure that at a time of crisis people get access to the best and most relevant information. But in doing that, it's incumbent upon us to ensure that we are not weeks and weeks latent in bringing those regulations and those messages to the people who require it. Because after all, they are our sons and daughters, they're our mothers and fathers, they're our relations, they're the people that underpin business, education, the health service that we rely on. We need to ensure that when, when, when we give a message like today, we're talking about regulations, many of them which are actually being superseded, 
the people may listen to this and get confused, and that's why. So that's why I would, I, I would plead with the TEO to step up here. There's four ministers in that office. Four. Not one. Four. Why are they not here today? I don't get crossed very often, but I'm crossed today because I don't believe it should fall on the health minister's shoulders solely at a time of crisis. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if you'll indulge me, I know a little bit, and I, I will always go back to it because it's 16 wonderful years in the fire service about a thing called span of control. Span of control is the terminology used um, when you're dealing with crisis and big events. And everybody has a capacity to deal professionally with a limited amount of work, regardless of how good you are. And that's why in the fire service, in the prison service, in the police service, in nursing and every other profession, the workload is spread. And that is to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks. This isn't politics. This is people's lives. Let's get our act together. And I want the TEO office to hear that today, loud from this chamber. And I hope that the minister can address that. And perhaps he, he might square his shoulders and say, no, Robbie, I'm, I'm, I'm big enough, I can take it. I hope he's humble enough to say, no, I will accept all and every bit of help that I can get from every office in there. And that is everybody's responsibility. I'm going to return to face coverings because I'm in my role as an education spokesperson, that's probably one of the places where a lot of the debate has been recently with regard to teachers, with regard to pupils, with regard to the messaging that we're getting from our scientific and medical officers with regard to who and, and, and who doesn't need to wear in certain circumstances. And this is about risk mitigation. This isn't just about risk assessment. This is about dynamic risk assessment. This is about balancing what we are building into in our future, what we can keep open, what we can expose our kids to. And I'm not talking about corona. I'm talking about their education. I'm talking about their societal well-being. I'm talking about their mental health as well. So that's why we need the collegiate voice coming from here, coming from our executive office. That's why we need our first and deputy first minister standing side by side, giving that message and not contradicting each other and knowing what each other is saying, because that's what the people of this country, regardless of where you're from, deserve today uh, in, Nor in Northern Ireland. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the point I was making earlier and that you're re uh, reiterating here about the issue of not coming to this place to give the information, the press is an incredibly important place. They have very important questions to ask, but they generally only get one question each across about a half dozen outlets, where if ministers come to here, there's potentially 89 other people that can get up and ask questions, and we can get right drilled down into the detail that people are contacting us about, and that that is why this place is the most important place to come and give the information, because there's very little room to hide in here where there is in a very controlled environment to the press. For his intervention, I, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with his intervention because I think one of the things that was perhaps missing from here when we went into restricted uh, assembly business that we didn't get with the reduction in written questions, oral questions, and, but that's not the case now. And I think we missed an opportunity perhaps in the summer where the mechanisms did exist when we could have come in here to bring these regulations in a number of weeks ago. Those, those mechanisms existed, and we could have come in in short term to do short amounts of business. And perhaps, as the, as the member has, 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 has rightly said, this would reduce the risk for conflating the messages and mixed messages. Absolutely. And, and just on that point, I know people like the grandstand at times, but you know, we should have come in over August, we should have come in over the summer. The agreement we all made was that the staff and the assembly also need a break that they have been working extremely hard from the, uh, the time the Assembly get back up and running again. Uh, and it is the case that they can only take leave, many of them, when the Assembly is in recess. So, I mean, let, let's forget about the grants, Stanton. Deal with the issues as they exist. Good for his intervention, but I think he's, he's totally off skew here. That's not grandstand, and it's stating facts that on the Commission Business Committee, which I sit, we actually agreed those mechanisms that if there was a need, and I would suggest to the member there is a need because we're in a crisis situation. This is un, un, unparalleled, unprecedented times. And, and it's not grandstand, it's not politics, it's the lives of my family, your family, and everybody in our communities. And really, could we not have come in for a half a day? This isn't days of work, this is, this is a two hour debate that's going to happen um, today. 
And it is important that we don't grandstand, to be fair. It is important that we don't politic and we don't thrash the life out of things that don't need to be discussed. But this is about improving what we do, ensuring that regulations like these come forward in good time. They get the level of scrutiny that they deserve. Why? Because we need to give the public every single bit of confidence that we can. We need to show the leadership and we need to adhere to the restrictions ourselves and ensure we set that example as political leavers and public servants. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise to support the health protection regulations as amended. And before I move into the substance of my speech, I would take exception for the comments made there by Robbie Butler. I don't believe that these are petty squabbles. I think that the concerns that I am going to raise, which very much well, um, reflect what um, my colleague on the health committee has said. Um, are not petty. We are not politicking. This, the, we are raising legitimate concerns on behalf of our constituents. This is a debating chamber, and we have every right to do that, so don't try and quash that down. You said yourself it is almost impossible to find and access relevant information, and that is the concerns we are raising today. So, in this case, um, it is not quite as necessary as the last time to point out that the regulations run profoundly contrary to my party's liberal instincts. Because as of the number two regulations applying from 24th of July, we have at least had them the right way around. They specifically make prohibitions on public health grounds rather than not allowing us to cross our front door without specific reason. For all that, we remain in a situation where civil liberties are remarkably constrained to agree which does not require constant scrutiny to ensure that it is absolutely necessary for the sake of public health. And and because I am so annoyed, I will raise the point that came up at Health Committee last week. We received notification that it was not always going to be possible that we had a departmental official to come along and speak to us about the proposed health protection regulation changes. How ludicrous that the scrutiny body for health protection regulations was not going to be able to get the draftsman of those changes along to um, support us in our deliberations and our thinking around that. We cannot shut down the scrutiny just to protect a minister. We, we're not going to do that. No, I'm not, because I took enough nonsense from your party over the weekend. Thank you. So moving on, Mr Deputy Speaker. If there was one advantage to the way previous regulations were worded or implemented, it was simplicity. Everyone knew that they could only cross their door for specific purposes. As we have opened up, things have become more complex. What we are aiming for at all time is voluntary compliance. If we are having to enter into a situation where enforcement becomes a significant issue, we have taken a wrong turning. Voluntary compliance will come about if the rules are clear and if the reasons for them are provided in a transparent manner. It has to be said there is nothing about the announcements by the Executive Office and Department of Health over the past 10 days or so which qualifies for either of these. On to confusion. They piled even more and greater confusion. On one hand, restrictions were to be tightened. On the other, they were to be eased. We ended up with the farce of a press statement from the Department of Health stating restrictions applied in certain areas when the annex to the regulations of the press statement were announcing that they applied to certain other areas too. Then, having spent a week trying to work out whether Castlereagh was in Belfast, we ended up having to include all of Northern Ireland. Providing such a confused response does not bode well for public confidence in what the Executive Office is doing with these regulations, nor for the practical likelihood of public compliance. Not least since we have seen so many people here unsure as to what the rules are and where they actually apply. Mr Deputy Speaker, communication is about creating understanding. None of what I'm about to say is aimed at discouraging compliance, quite the opposite. But the public need to understand the rules and the reasons in order to comply with them. There should at all times be absolute clarity. If, for example, our concern is social gatherings and urban spaces, then apply the rules to all social gatherings in all urban spaces. It should not have taken 10 days to work that out. What is more, make these rules simple understandable and enforceable. But once we start trying to determine one rule for the work garage, 
another for the living room, and still another for the garden. We have lost people. And let me move on to the Holy Land. And I wasn't going to raise it, but again, there was a side word swipe, swipe at me in the chamber here yesterday about this. I've been raising this issue of the Holy Lands with the health minister and the chief medical officer since the start of March. I chair and facilitate the HALO group in, in the area, and I've been working with the residents there for years. So I am acutely aware of the issues that are going on there. And I said that the parties in the houses have been happening from June, and I misspoke. I meant that once the restrictions started to lift and people could go back to the houses that the parties reassumed. I have been receiving communication all morning from residents in that area and the people on the HALO group because the parties were still happening last night. There's six people were standing one side of the garden um, wall and then there was people standing on the street and they've now moved, started moving into the alleyways to have their parties to avoid detection. So despite the fact that there are a lot of words have been said in this chamber in the last week about how they were going to enforce compliance, it's not happening. So as, as the chair of the health committee pointed out there, I asked last week if there could be guidance, whether it's HMOs or whether it's guidance for students. I don't care what way it's bodied, but we have to have something that specifically relates to the people in that area. Because as I keep pointing out, whether it's in the chamber, health committee or on the media, we have up to nine people living in these houses and it's deemed to be one house. They then go home at the weekend, play in their sports club, visit their grannies, and a lot of them have to go home because they don't even have washing machines because the houses have been so developed. There are specific circumstances in the Holy Land. We also know that some of the HMOs are occupied by people from the Roma community, many of whom work in the meat processing plants, and we know that there are specific um, vulnerabilities around those work placements as well. Not least then we have the settled community there, and I know of some residents who are in their 80s and 90s. It is a horrendous place. And these people in their 80s and 90s, there's only one corner shop. The kids are going into the shop, young people are going into the shops. They're not wearing their masks and they're not social distancing. And the, and the local people are feeling incredibly vulnerable. And again, I don't appreciate when I get sideways swipes in this chamber because I continue to raise this issue because it just doesn't affect my constituency. It affects the whole of this country. So moving on, I'm also concerned at our inability to enforce guidance in any meaningful way. People, for example, who have booked weddings for 200 people are having the choice of losing thousands of pounds of deposits or to proceed with them even when they themselves recognise them to be at high risks because there is no specific rule which enables them to cancel in the interest of public safety and be assured a refund. Risk assessments seem too much to consist of people marking their own homework. We do consider we do need to consider whether guidance based on sound scientific advice should not in fact be enforceable or at least whether events which are bound to breach it may be preventable. Even with face coverings as I have just referenced there, the topic of two of the set of regulations we are looking at, the rules are too complex. In most other jurisdictions the rules are much simpler. As soon as you enter a public building you are obliged to wear a face covering with the exception of when you are seated or um, seated to eat or drink and then obviously some people with health conditions will have um, exemptions. So at the minute um, you, you need to wear a mask in a shop but you don't need to wear it in a, a coffee shop. You are going to need to wear it in a bar but you don't need to wear it in a restaurant or a hotel. This is over complicated, it is confusing and it is counterintuitive and we do, it does not need to be that way. So in conclusion Mr Deputy Speaker. I think that there's still um, goodwill to the executive out there, um, to the messaging, not least the fact that people are still so supportive of our health service and the sterling work that they're doing and our other frontline um, workers. But the missteps over the last few days have eroded confidence and there is now mass confusion. With regard to these regulations and the guidance around them, we need to communicate better with less confusion and more clarity to deliver full compliance. Thank you. Iram Sir Pat Sheehan on can I call Pat Sheehan? Uh I've got a last count Corla. Um uh, and uh, I mean we've been here before, we've discussed all these uh, coronavirus regulations and this is a set that by and large has already been overtaken by other regulations. Uh, and there are a couple of important points I, I want to make in regard to all the legislation that we brought forward in this assembly. Um, and you know, most of it has been draconian. Under normal circumstances, we wouldn't be bringing legislation like this in front of the House. Most of us certainly wouldn't be supporting it anyway. Uh, but there, there are two aspects of all of this which are important. And, and Paula has just made the point: there needs to be clear messaging. 
easily understood messages uh, that people can act on and that can be easily enforced. Uh, and the other aspect of all of this is that we're effectively asking the population to enter into a contract. We are going to introduce draconian legislation, but it's for your own good. And in order to help you, this is what we're going to do. We're going to test, we're going to trace, we're going to isolate, we're going to support those who have to isolate, uh, and we're going to make uh, facilities available to treat people who, who contract this virus. So, um, and I, I'm not going to be too critical about the, uh, uh, the regulations, because I appreciate it is difficult to get things right. And I have to say, first of all, I, I admire the loyalty of the members of the Ulster Unionist Party and circling the wagons around you, Minister. And I have to, <laughs> I have to congratulate Alan on the, on the sterling work he does in the committee. Yes, Robbie, I'll give way. <laughs> I, 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 pre, I appreciate that, and, and it is good that, that there is some brevity in here at times, and, and Alan's work is, is outstanding, but he does a good job on the health committee. But, but the member not agree with me. I, mean, I had a phone call this morning uh, of a lady who's uh, just less than 16. She's now on a ventilator. Um, due to COVID this morning. And BT28 is where I live and the restrictions that were placed in there. I do agree with you, by the way, that, that some of the restrictions feel draconian, but in a time of absolute public uh, pandemic and safety, it is important that we do not confuse the messaging in here in any shape or form. And whether you're an MLA who's speaking on a committee, that you need to be up to date with all of the information and ensure uh, that you're there with regard to the messaging from the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer. Uh, I thank the member for his intervention. I don't disagree with anything he said. Um, and, 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 and I'm not here to, uh, you know, to, to, to criticise the minister as such, but I am going to relay some of my own experience because I've made the point. We've entered into a contract with the population, and, and, and one aspect of that contract is that we're going to provide testing, and we're going to provide a system where people don't have to jump through hoops to get tested. And I'm going to tell you here my own personal experience from Sunday fortnight ago, when my four-year-old daughter developed a temperature. It wasn't a very high temperature, uh, and she had a bit of a runny nose. If COVID wasn't here, I'd have said she's a bit of a head cold. She started in the primary one uh, the week previously. She's picked something up, and you know, she hadn't uh, lost her appetite, she, was, she hadn't stopped running about, uh, she was okay. Under normal circumstances, she would have gone into school on Monday morning. However, after discussion uh, with the wife, we decided that, well, because she has one of the symptoms, we should uh, seek some advice. So we phoned uh, 111. And the advice we got there was that they don't give out advice about children as young as that and I needed to phone the GP the following morning, on Monday morning, which I did. Uh, got through to the GP, uh, <clears throat> which, which was good, because a lot of people at the moment are saying they can't get through to GPs. In fact, we did a, a, a survey in the White Rock area recently in regard to the flu job to see how many people you know, usually get the flu job and are have problem, having problems this year getting it. Uh, and a large number of the people we spoke to told us that they couldn't even get through to their GP on the phone. So there, there are problems there as well. But getting back to my own story, uh, I phoned the GP surgery, and they advised me to phone 119 and book a test. So I went on to the phone, uh, and I stayed on the phone, and stayed on the phone, and stayed on the phone, and then the phone cut out, and I went back on the phone and stayed on the phone, uh, and eventually I just gave up. I was on the phone probably nearly an hour and a half trying to get through. So I said, OK, I'll go on the website and try to book a home testing kit, which I did. I went online, and lo and behold, no home testing kits available at this time. So uh, I decided then, right, I've, I've started this, so I may finish it. 
I went online to try and book a drive-through test. Uh, the word came back, there was availability in Stranraer. Now, I have to say, this isn't an isolated incident. Uh, I actually put it up on Twitter that evening uh, and got a, a, a boatload of responses. People who were also being sent to Stranraer, some being sent to Wales, uh, one being sell, sent to Telford in Shropshire. Uh, and you know, uh, a, a lot of people experiencing the same problems. And I just uh, see in, in our WhatsApp group this morning from one of our other MLAs that a constituent of theirs in Newry and Mourne is also being sent to Stranraer today. Now, I know it's not possible. People aren't going to be traveling to Stranraer. But what this does is that it exposes the problems in the testing system. So, yes, go ahead. Would the member agree uh, the point that I've made at the committee that had, if we could make home testing kits available in places such as pharmacies, you could have been down to a pharmacy and back at your house within about 10 minutes and the test probably would have been into the post later that afternoon and you would have had the result the next day. And that if there aren't test kits, we need to get them, but making them very easily accessible to people would increase the speed and would have helped you in a situation like this. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and just as you make that point, uh, I, I uh, visited a uh, community pharmacy in my own constituency uh, on Friday and spoke to them uh, about a number of issues, one including the provision of the flu job and the community pharmacies are already providing those to health workers free of charge. And the others, I think it's, they're charging 12 quid. But I asked them, was there capacity within the community pharmacy uh, system to carry out uh, COVID tests as well? And, and they felt there was, with, 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 with a small amount of training, they could be uh, carrying out testing or at least delivering home testing kits or, or, or some system that would uh, deal with the, the difficulties that exist in the current system. But anyway, to get back to my own story, uh, everything I've told you so far happened on the Monday. I couldn't get anything. I went back on on Tuesday morning and was able to order a home testing kit. Uh, that home testing kit didn't arrive until tea time on Wednesday. Uh, and they tell you in the guidelines they give you in that that you're not to post, well, first of all, you're to post it in a priority post box. I didn't know there was such a thing until, until this. Uh, but you can't post it unless it's in the box at least an hour before the last collection. And the last collection in, in the area I live was at 4.45. So it was too late. So I had to do the test the following morning, which was Thursday. Uh, and then posted it off. It was going to Glasgow. Uh, presumably it wasn't arriving until the Friday. We're then into the weekend. Uh, and uh, I mean, to cut a long story short, the result didn't come back until the Tuesday. Of course it was negative, as I, as I expect it to be. But the upshot of it all was that, uh, first of all, my uh, four-year-old child missed over a week at school. My eight-year-old child missed over a week at school. I had to self-isolate, and my wife had to self-isolate, and all the difficulties that go along with that. And what I'm telling you isn't unique. There's a problem in the testing system. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. And uh, I trust your child has made a speedy recovery. Mr. Speaker, just on the outskirts, well, you have made a speedy recovery, and everything's all right at home. That's good. On the outskirts of Lisburn, I don't want to mention any names, but there is a facility which got a large amount of money uh, in order to set up its business. I see that uh, a former minister uh, of the, of, from a former British minister that was sent over here sits on the board. Uh, the shambles that has gone round on that testing. Um, the amount of public money that went into it from Northern Ireland in order to set that up as well has to be a serious concern that we need to take on here. Simply, 
to have that facility where we have it in Northern Ireland, those tests should be rolled out much quicker to our inhabitants here, simply by the amount of public money that went into that facility. Okay. Okay. We do seem to be getting a little bit off the theme of, of the motions here. We're talking about testing. I don't see anything on the order paper that uh, refers to testing. So just uh, I wonder if the speaker could maybe rule. Uh, are we moving a little bit off the, uh, the subject matter of what's in front of us this morning? I would have to say on this debate I have allowed a fair bit of latitude. Uh, I think, to be fair, it would be uh, a bit of an anomaly to the debate if we didn't at least touch upon testing uh, that, uh, that it does have an impact on. It's difficult to say that you cannot talk about it whenever it's an issue and whenever these regulations refer to health prevention. So I've allowed that degree of latitude to inform the Minister and to inform the debate here. Uh, Gordon Margaret, I thank the member for his intervention. And uh, I mean, I made the point at the outset that I think the regulations are part of a contract. Uh, you know, that, that, that we as political leaders have to provide a proper system uh, for testing and for uh, ensuring that uh, we, we prevent the spread of this disease as much as possible. But I'll just finish on, on that point that there's a problem with the testing. It needs sorted. If people aren't, have, don't have confidence in the system, and I know that I had to jump through hoops, but I know there are other people who would give up at the first hurdle or the second hurdle or the third hurdle. You know, people aren't just going to get tested, and it's important that they do. And I'll, I'll just give you one other example, because it was, it was one of our councillors who had been out socialising the previous weekend. The weekend after, he woke up at 8 o'clock in the morning, and he had a high temperature. He took his temperature, and it was 40 degrees. And he says, right, I better phone for a test here. Uh, and, and, and that's what he did. And he booked a test. At 10 o'clock, he took his temperature again, and it was back to normal. And what he said was that if he had waited until 10 o'clock and taken his temperature again then and it was back to normal, he probably wouldn't have gone for a test. He would have thought it was some aberration. He was warm during the night, the too many blankets on the bed or, or whatever. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why testing is so important and needs to be streamlined. And when people need a test, they can get a test. Aram Sir Orlehi Flynn, Hon uh, Kanchai call Orlehi Flynn. Gorma Yogit, Alas Kankolia, it's Orlea, the pronunciation, thank you. Um, I rise to support these regulations and I do so as I think about the rise in new cases of coronavirus within our communities and within the health service. As others have said, the virus is still with us and we can't downplay that fact. It has been said before, but it cannot be said enough that these regulations wouldn't be considered if we were not in a public health emergency. Um, and I want to address two themes today, the first being the impact that the regulations have on people, but secondly, the need for support. I believe it's essential that we do not forget the impact that each of these regulations have on individuals, families and communities. Um, I know many have already acknowledged that point, but it is vital that this is to the forefront of our minds as we consider and discuss the regulations. And there are so many knock-on impacts that need to be addressed where families are unable to spend time with one another, with um, visiting loved ones in care homes or hospitals, and for the many out there who are now dealing with the stress and the breakdown of a normal work-life balance. However, these regulations, I feel, are necessary, um, although I know they have since been overtaken by the recent changes as of last night. Uh, but just to bring it back to the issue of the face coverings, um, the promotion, in my opinion, of the face coverings was slow. Um, it was advised at the start only for public transport, and then it was included to shops and retail outlets. Um, I believe that the lack of urgency when the evidence pointed to the use of face, face coverings did little for promoting their uptake um, at that crucial time. And I would just like to urge everyone who can wear a face covering to please wear one. Um, it shouldn't be seen as a muzzle, but sensible precaution to a virus that we know is spread by droplets from the breath. 
and just similar to some of the points that Colin and Paula and, and Pat touched on um, earlier regarding communications. I would also like to urge the Department and the PHA to undertake a more thorough public health messaging campaign to reinforce the message um, around the face coverings and, and the general, more general update around the, the restrictions, as was announced last night. Um, as I am detecting a certain level of fatigue and confusion around what is in place now. And just to give you an example of when the regulations appeared before the Health Committee, um, I did raise last week, I think it was or the week before, the issue around the face coverings and the issue around the use of face shields, which I have seen being used increasingly um, in, within restaurants and retail outlets, not only by members of staff, but they are being used by the public also. And it turns out that, that face shields um, are not, and I quote, they're not considered to be a face covering in the context of these regulations. Um, now, I know that for many people this will come as a surprise, but again, it's on the important issues around this. Where is the public um, message campaign and where is the direction and the clarity that the public and the workers who are using, for, as the example used, um, these face shields, um, where is the clarity from, from the Department of Health or indeed from the Public Health Agency? Um, Yes, I will. Yeah. It's just following on from the point that you make, which is, is, is crucial and was made to us in the Health Committee last week that the face shields aren't uh, considered appropriate, but yet many people within a work environment wear those because they're much more comfortable to wear because they almost slip on like a pair of glasses rather than an actual face mask. But then just highlights the confusion that under the regulations, people aren't required to wear any covering in their workplace because sometimes then the message might be that if somebody's wearing a shield in their work that they're not wearing the correct item, but yet they're not actually required to wear the item. And that just aids how we need to have a clear uh, message that we send out to people. Yep. And I'd just like to thank the member for his intervention and I agree with everything that he did say and I mean again I know a lot of the conversation has focused on the um, face coverings um, mostly today but you know that's only a microcosm of everything else that's entailed within the, within the regulations and that broader confusion um, that, that can exist um, out within the public. So just before I finish um, I'd like to make a simple point that I know much has been said about that we all now need to live um, and learn to live uh, with this virus, and that is absolutely correct, but it shouldn't mean that we let the virus pass us by without doing anything. So I completely understand the need for the regulations um, that the Minister has brought forward, and I believe that um, we must all look at, um, consider and scrutinise all options um, that we're faced with in our efforts to help and protect the public um, throughout this pandemic. Thank you. Aaron, sir, Justin McNulty, hon Kanch. I call Justin McNulty. Gormay Ogots, last count caller. Can I thank the Minister for bringing these regulations before the House today? Whilst I appreciate this is a, ter this is a time of terrible ter turmoil, like the Minister and many, many others in this chamber, I do note some of these regulations have been superseded by events and time. As Concordia, by my nature, I am not someone who likes to see government restrict the movements of our people. It does not sit easy with me that there are, there are restrictions on civil liberties, nor does it sit easy with me that restrictions have been imposed, have been imposed that mean our economy has been compressed, placing jobs, our economy and families under real strain. However, I understand that our economy can rebound. People's lives cannot. As the Minister has said, we are at a critical time in our fight against the virus, and we must redouble our efforts to suppress this virus, protect the health of our population, and protect the health and well-being of our frontline workers, and especially healthcare workers. Last count, Corla, whilst much has been done, I fear that the public's buy-in to the fight against COVID-19 is being tested. People are fed up hearing about the coronavirus, COVID-19. They are frustrated with restrictions on their lives and they get really angry when they are making a real effort to comply with the regulations, whilst others, especially those in leadership positions, do not. However, however uncomfortable or inconvenient it feels, it is imperative that we persevere and we must all lead by example. I want to acknowledge the community effort in the battle against COVID-19. 
I know in my local area, and indeed across the north, across this island, the GAA has been the backbone of the community response. Be that in delivering food hampers or hot meals during the, tight, the toughest times of their restrictions, or just checking out for people lonely at home, they've been unbelievable. And on this day of all day, when 18 years ago today, my arma teammates and I won the All-Ireland, I could not be, pr be prouder of the GAA and all it stands for. No. I know what you're going to say, so there's no point. I also want to express my gratitude to the frontline staff in our hospitals. I also want to express my gratitude to the frontline staff in our hospitals and healthcare settings who have fought the good fight and who are fighting the good fight under incredible pressure and duress, particularly nurses, doctors, healthcare workers in the community and in nursing homes and in their hospitals. We owe them a deep and sincere thanks. I especially note the medical teams for the commitment, dedication and devotion at Daisy Hill Hospital and Craigavon Area Hospital, where in the face of COVID outbreaks and so many staff off self-isolating, they are still stepping up and caring for the patients. As a member of the Education Committee, I must also pay tribute to the teachers, school workforce, parents and children who have had to change their whole way of teaching and learning. They have shown the rest of us just how we can stand and should be able to adopt to what has now become the new norm. Mr Speaker, I have sought to abide by the regulations and guidelines. Like many others, I could not visit my parents in their home. I could not attend the funerals of people I knew, people like John Dallas and John Hume. Some of the messaging has been unclear. Behaviour from those who should know better has been inconsistent. And uh, messages around the regulations and communications, especially around those regulations, have been mixed. We need to sharpen our message. We need to lead by example and suppress this virus. I'm finished. Gurum, I'll get last count. Last count, Sir Pat Catney, on Kanche. I call Pat Catney. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, people need clarity. They are currently confused about what they can and cannot do. We recognise this is not black nor white, and a level of confusion is unfortunately inevitable. But the Joint First Ministers need to be clear with the people if they want compliance. Recognised restrictions are a necessity. The SDLP have always been led by the medical and the scientific evidence. Businesses and workers, they will need support, and businesses need that clarity in order for to try and survive. And what uh, my colleague from South Armagh said earlier, um, when I think of those that are in the economy and out working, our lives are mixed, they're interwoven, so they are. It's part of who we are in order to work and see the successes in the hands of our labour, in order to build healthy, strong lives. Later on today at 1 o'clock, my colleague from, from West Belfast is uh, having an APG on mental health. These are some of the outreachings of all of this, and no doubt our Minister knows this well, much better than I do. And I'm going to take this moment to thank the Minister um, for health, because his door has always been open to me, and I understand the great burden which has been placed on him. No one knew or no one seen this coming at the time of that acceptance, but uh, I, I realise that uh, where we are and what we have to do is for the greater good. Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's been mentioned several times now in relation to the messaging and the clarity around the messaging and indeed the levels of support that are provided to people to self-isolate. But I wonder, Minister, I have asked a question previously from you in relation to the spend of your department on the public messaging campaign. Um, you haven't had an opportunity, but maybe you can give us some more information on that today and also on what has been spent in terms of providing support for people who need it to isolate. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, businesses and workers will need support. We are hurtling towards a cliff edge with the furlough scheme uh, closing next month, 
uh, well, I hope it doesn't close, but it's starting to close anyhow. And people are frightened about their lives, but also their livelihoods. It's highly um, laudable that there is no economic recovery strategy pro uh, produced by this executive. How will we get out of this? What out of this crisis and build back better if we are not to have a plan? The executive need to get real about investing in the infrastructure, green energy, and other timely interventions that will help us kickstart our economy again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now call um, Mr. Alan Chambers. Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, over the last few weeks, uh, I, along, I'm sure, with everybody else in, in this House, have been receiving an avalanche of emails um, from a small group of people. Uh, some of them run to 5,000 words, lots of links to YouTube and all, uh, all sorts of statements from uh, social media. And frankly, I, I don't know where these people get the time uh, to do what they do. And the theme is that uh, all of this is some sort of a government conspiracy. Um, it's not real. And it's really a, a huge attack um, on our human rights. Uh, in fact, you know, we had a musician there just last week who's penned a song with the words in it, fascist bullies. That's pretty strong language for people who are trying to do something good, something to try and save lives. And you know, to go back to human rights, the most basic human right is the right to life. And I think that's what it's all about, and that's what we all should be endeavouring uh, to protect, is life. Now, we talk about, there's a lot of talk this morning about these regulations are, they're complicated. They're complicated. I don't understand them. I need more clarity. Um, I don't think there's anything complicated about it. When I was bringing up a young family, and we had an open fire in our living room, I didn't need a statutory regulation to tell me to put a fire guard on the fire, to protect my children from falling into the fire. It's called common sense. And I think in relation to this uh, virus, this virus is out there. It wants to kill people. It is killing people. We've heard about the disastrous situation in the two hospitals. And there may well be other hospitals affected before this is all over. And there may well be dozens, hundreds of people this winter that will die as a result of this virus. What's complicated? about trying to stop it and its tracks? What's complicated about using a bit of common sense? Why do we all need to be told and have it spelt out is what we can do and what we shouldn't do and when we should do it? It's common sense, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. McGrath said that there are he had put something on social media, and he's got hundreds of, of people, and a lot of those people saying that don't want regulations. And I would suggest that those people who don't want regulations are maybe the type of people that are invading sports pitches. They're maybe the type of people that are, even as we speak, organizing house parties for this weekend. And maybe they're the type of people that are running mad around the Holy Lands. Those are the sort of people who don't want regulations. Those are the sort of people who don't care about the rest of us. They have no sense of civic responsibility. If they did, if they did, they certainly wouldn't be doing what they do. We we'll also hear about, uh, you know, about the, 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 the way the regulations are getting pushed through quickly. And, I understand that, and you know, we keep talking about in normal times we wouldn't tolerate certain things that are happening. Um, and certainly, I mean, we all know that when a law goes through this house, it's a laborious, lengthy journey uh, from start to finish. We are actually producing laws here uh, and pushing them through uh, in ours, 
and then coming back a fortnight later and we're changing them and altering them because that is the nature of the emergency that we find ourselves in. And, you know, when the executive sit down, and, and I'm not going to defend the executive, I think he should be here this morning themselves to defend himself, but anyway, that said, sorry, yeah. Um, I'm just reflecting on, on what you said about these being common sense, and I think, I think it actually needs to be said, while there are elements of common sense, we must be conscious that we are asking the public to do things which are extraordinary. These are unprecedented times, and we should not minimise or dismiss the impact it's having on the public. What we should be doing is providing a clear rationale and providing them with the support they need. Thank you. I'll address that uh, later in my uh, comments, uh, Mr McGrath. Uh, but anyway, the, um, we're talking about uh, yesterday in the debate about dementia, I think it might have been the minister, it might have been Mr Dixon, I can't remember, said about the fact that it was good that here we are sitting in the House uh, talking about something that affects every home and talking about our personal experiences. In other words, that we're not, the public maybe sometimes think we are sitting up here in a bubble and uh, we don't really know what's going on out there. But uh, the dementia debate, we all know because we all had personal experiences to talk about. And I think it's the same uh, with this virus, you know, that we're not sitting up here and the ministers aren't sitting up here trying to find ways to make life deliberately uh, difficult for the public. And I always remember my days in local government uh, when you had to make maybe hard decisions around increasing the rates. And people would say to you, you know, wh why are you doing this? You know, what's your rationale? And my reply used to be, well, look, you know, I'm a rate payer. My family are all rate payers. I'm not doing this to make life awkward for anybody. Uh, certainly not a, a turkey voting for Christmas. And I think that's the, the case here. We have to make regulations that we don't like, but they are affecting our families as well uh, and affecting our way of life. The, um, I'm, I'm disappointed, sorry. Uh, just, it's a point that, you know, again about the rates. I'm sure the response wouldn't have been the reason that we're increasing the rates is because it's common sense you would have put together the argument that was there. And I think the point that you're making, we're all actually on the same page here, it's just coming from different directions, that if we have to have the regulations clearly articulate and why we have them and what they are, might actually stop a lot of the people out there who are maybe confused and don't understand the rationale for it, who then automatically go to the fourth base of, nah, we don't want any of that. And it's that clear message, if we could get to there, it would be much more helpful. I, I rather despair of anybody that doesn't understand how serious the situation is and, and don't understand what their civic responsibilities uh, are. I really despair for those people. Um, but, I mean, we had a situation here where the junior ministers used to come into the chamber uh, and present these uh, SRs. Uh, and I think that the, that reflected uh, more evenly and more fairly the fact that the decisions around the creation of these uh, SRs are actually executive decisions. Uh, whereas this morning we have the health minister who is in the middle of, of fighting a, a pandemic and helping to fight it with a, a, a dedicated staff around him, uh, having to come in uh, and do stuff that really the junior ministers maybe uh, could have come in and done uh, on his behalf. But that, that has been withdrawn. Uh, by the executive office. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. I've put a, a number of written questions in to try and establish why that is the case, but that is what it is. But if I could just go on to some of the comments that, that members have made. Um, Mrs Bradshaw uh, indicated that her party supported, at the very start of her speech, supported these regulations. Uh, but then went on to point out a lot of the shortcomings and uh, uh, contradictory parts of them in relation to maybe face coverings and, and restaurants and, and shops and, and all the rest of it. But, I mean, at the end of the day, it was an executive decision and the Alliance Party do have a minister on the executive. Uh, so you can't have it every way. You can't have it every way. And also, M Mrs Bradshaw is talking about confusion. She's talking about clear messaging. I would just remind her that back in June at the Health Committee, she said, we're pretty much through the pandemic. 
we are pretty much through the pandemic. That was a message on the record at the Health Committee. And we are supposed to be providing leadership, and people in this House are calling out for leadership. I would suggest that that was actually quite irresponsible. Leadership, and I'm glad that on that occasion, both the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer uh, called her out uh, on it. We still haven't had an apology or a retraction of that uh, remark. Um, would the member uh, just uh, it, agree we talked earlier about affording a bit of latitude? Uh, I have well, afforded I, I quite a bit of latitude. I would ask the Speaker to show the same latitude to no, me, Mr. Speaker, I have as afforded I have shown the others. If, if you reflect on your comments and answer, you will see I have done exactly that. So okay. perhaps we, we could move back again, please. Okay. I will just refer then to some of the comments as well that have been made. Uh, Mr. Gillen, you there said about uh, spending money, what, what money has been spent on, on advertising and stuff. And I will we'll, I'll comment on that in, in a moment. And Mr. Sheehan made the uh, comment that uh, the Ulster Unionist Party were uh, protecting uh, uh, their minister. But a couple of issues. I just remind uh, Pat that just one week after the uh, story funeral, Bobby Story funeral, he did say at the Health Committee, let's move on. Come on, let's move on. Put this behind us. One week after, when the consequences and the outcomes of that funeral on medical terms wouldn't have been known. And in terms of spending money on advertising, this executive and this government can spend millions on advertising. But let me say that the events at that funeral would have totally neutralised any message and any amount of money that was spent on messaging by what happened at that funeral when you had senior ministers, a deputy first minister, MLAs attending, MPs attending that funeral, completely in contradiction uh, with all the regulations uh, and advice. So, you know, really, we really need to uh, really get real around these things. Uh, and, you know, talk about protecting uh, the minister. I don't, I don't think the minister uh, needs protecting. Uh, and I can't just say that uh, it's, uh, if, if people think that uh, my job on, uh, on earth is to protect the health minister, I would just say that it is actually one of the easiest jobs that anybody could ever be given. Because I think that the public agree, the media agree, and I think even begrudgingly in this House we agree that he's doing a great job. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Doug Beattie. Doug Beattie. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Speaker. You, you, you're speaking in my bad ear. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, and, and I will thank um, the Minister Robin Swan uh, for being here today. And, and, and I don't care if people think I'm here to protect Robin Swan, because uh, I will say it, and I will say it with facts. Because Robin Swan, uh, as a minister, has been in this chamber far more than any other minister. He has answered oral questions far more than any other minister. He has answered motions far more than any other. Um, he has attended adjournment debates more than any other minister. He has given detailed answers. He has took the, not just, not just yet, pardon me while, he has, he has took the criticism in here, online and elsewhere. He has fronted up the media briefings, filled the gap when the first and deputy first minister had a spat and couldn't. And he does all of this while he deals with the legacy of the crisis in our health service. Now I find out that the health minister sits on the executive enforcement working group while the justice minister does not. Let that sink in. During this unprecedented crisis, the Justice Minister does not sit on the Enforcement Working Group. I think this laissez-faire approach to COVID-19 by the Justice Minister is genuinely shameful. And people need to be calling her out in regards to that, because not only should she be on that working group, she should be chairing that working group. Pat, give away to you. 
for giving way. Uh, I, I don't think the Ulster Unionists should get too defensive about the allegation that was made earlier on. It was, it was a light-hearted comment, uh, and there's no, there's no need to get so defensive. Robin has done a reasonably good job. Uh, I, I, I'd be the first to say that. And, and I congratulate him in particular on the decision to call a public inquiry into the events in, in, in Muckamore. That, well, that was a very good decision. So, well done. Pat, thank you for your support of the, uh, the Ulster Unionist Party. It's, it's, always, it's always very welcome. Um, but I would say, and I would add to what my colleague said, is now we have, um, now we have the Health Minister having to move these regulations, whereas once before it was the two junior ministers. So the executive office with four ministers no longer take responsibility for this, but the health minister does. And as has been said, a lot of these things, a lot of these regulations come from the executive and they are proposed by the executive office. Thank goodness, thank goodness. The Ulster Unionist Party climbed out of the trenches and over the parapets and took up health while the rest of their parties, while the rest of the parties turned their noses to the wall. At the end of this crisis, Robin Swan will be able to stand tall, euphemistically. <laughs> well, well, while others will be looking at their, while others will be looking at their dereliction of duty, and there is some, and I have pointed one out. As for the regulations, there are many who will complain, and they have the right to complain. Everybody has a right to complain, and everybody has a right to give a point of view. It's easy to create a scenario, and we can all do it to unpick these regulations. And that's what people are doing. They're creating outlandish scenarios purely to unpick these regulations. Face masks. There are those who don't like wearing face masks. I don't like wearing a face mask. There are those who will say that it doesn't help. I disagree. But I'll be clear that if by wearing a face mask, I stop just one person just one person from getting sick, I will wear a face mask. If by wearing a face mask, I stop any elderly people from being frightened or concerned, I will wear a face mask. And I will say it openly to everybody. It's a matter of discipline. Have it in your pocket. Put it on when you need to put it on. Show some discipline. Wear a face mask. We've talked about messaging, and everybody is absolutely right. I don't think I can argue with anybody in here about the messaging not being quite right. And some of the decisions that are coming out of the executive are confusing. But please, everybody, do not focus your eyes on the health minister. Focus your eyes on the executive, where we all have a minister. And focus your eyes on the executive office. Who should, be, who should be driving. Yes, happy to give way. Thank the member for giving way. Would the member agree with me that uh, whilst um, we're, very, we're getting very defensive of the health minister, and I've certainly defended him much over the last number of months as well, um, but I believe this responsibility for, for our actions on this pandemic is across the executive, across all the ministers in the executive, and, and across this house. And I think... Uh, uh, but I would ask the member if he would agree with me that what would be more useful right now today in terms of addressing confusion is to ask people not to be confused for us to keep sharing the messages because they change daily. I mean, we understand they change daily and they must change daily to, to deal with the pandemic. But the most useful uh, action today would be for um, the Deputy First Minister to actually apologise for her actions at the Story Funeral um, and to show the public that actually that was the wrong thing to do and that, that she had, and to prove and to show that she is sorry and for other members of this house to do the same and to say that the right thing to do is actually to abide by the regulations and the guidelines. Um, 
I, I thank you for the intervention, I, and I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and there's the crux of the problem: is that some of our politicians have given ammunition to those people who are out there for them to try and undermine our health minister. But I have to say to my friend, and I say this um, uh, in, in, in the most gentlest way to all of those on this side of the house: Sammy Wilson's a disgrace. He is another disgrace for the way he has undermined our health message. He has an opinion, but as a just a minute, but as a MP, he must be careful because he is an influencer. And he has damaged our message. And just for reference to Sammy, he can put a mask on, go into a shop, buy an ice cream, step outside, take it off, and eat his ice cream. It's P1 common sense. And that is the fundamental problem. But I'll just, just a minute, Pat, if I can. But I, but I have to say, when I, when I say that to this side of the house, that I'll look to the other side of the house. And how embarrassed must you be sitting there talking about these regulations when your leader, your deputy first minister, has been called before the police to account for her actions in regards to COVID regulations? If the police find she is wrongdoing, she must resign. She must resign because we cannot pile bodies higher due to COVID-19 because of the actions of Michelle O'Neill. And you should get the moral courage to tell her that. Because I'll get the moral courage and I will tell her. Pat. When you were speaking on Sammy, and it probably adds into what you did there as well, it should be all sides of the house because I know that I would be supportive of what you've said there concerning Mr Wilson and any other ones who lapse or break the law. But, uh, and, and you're right, and, and, and I'll finish. And uh, I, I know that the whole tenure of what I've said here has probably been argumentative, uh, and, and, I, and I get that, um, because I have a real fundamental problem at this moment in time, and that is the fact is that we are still sniping at each other. And we are all in defensive mode. And I absolutely accept that I am doing the same here because we are all in defensive mode. And we're in defensive mode because people took us down that road. People took us down that road. But it wasn't our health minister. It was not our health minister who took us down that road. So people need to step back. I'm happy to step back if other people step back. And people need to account for themselves for what they did to exacerbate this health crisis. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I think any nation after six months would have difficulty in holding matters together in respect of the draconian measures to which we've all been subjected. I don't think there's anything particularly surprising about that. But of course, the aggravation is quite distinct in this part of the United Kingdom as to why it is difficult now to hold things together. I think there are three reasons. The first has been touched upon today and put very simply. Once more, yesterday, we had a lawgiver giving out the law who's a lawbreaker. Dress it up Duck and dive as much as you like, but that is the inescapable reality. That when Michelle O'Neill stands behind any podium, particularly upstairs, and pontificates about what needs to be done and what regulations are going to be made, she utterly lacks any credibility. And it's not just she that suffers the lack of credibility, but in consequence, the regulations that she makes suffers a lack of credibility because she is the lawgiver. And of course, we all know that Michelle O'Neill has no apology to make for breaking the regulations. She has had ample opportunity, no later than two occasions. I presented her with the opportunity yesterday in this House 
to apologise for breaking the law. But no, she is a higher loyalty to something much more nefarious than that. And so that is the first fundamental underminer in respect of these regulations. And it is not going away. Sinn Féin may wish it away, they may try to talk it away, but it is not going away. It is the abiding issue when it comes to the saleability and the credibility of these regulations, that she who made them didn't keep them. And unless and until that issue is addressed, then regulations from that source will never carry any credibility. And I pity the Health Minister in those circumstances, because he is doing his best, but he's doing the best with an executive which has undermined him through the Deputy First Minister from those early days. And no matter with what diligence and sincerity the Health Minister might seek to portray his message. And I don't agree with it all, by the way. But no matter with what sincerity he seeks to convey it, much of it is washed away by the actions of a Deputy First Minister who gets in her official car, whose junior minister gets in his official car, whose finance minister gets in his official car, whose community minister gets in her official car, and all, at public expense, travel to a funeral where the law is to be flighted. And then we're surprised that there's a leakage in public confidence, that there's slippage in adherence to the very regulations made from that source. That is the first remediable reason, but as yet unremedied reason, why any regulations emanating on COVID are fundamentally undermined. The second reason that those regulations are undermined is the inherent absurdity that lies within some of them. We had an example again last night that you cannot go to your children's houses, to your parents' houses, but you can go to a pub you cannot meet with those you can trust as to how they conduct themselves, but you can meet in a wet pub with a hundred people. That is so inherently absurd that it undermines the message. And of course, listening to the Deputy First Minister this morning, for what it's worth, she seemed to be telling us that students who party all week in the Holy Lands can go back home at the weekends. They can live in the family home over the weekend, but the grandparents of that family home who keep themselves to themselves, who are no risk to anyone, they can't go to the same home. Now, if the Deputy First Minister is right in her interpretation of the regulations it seems she drafted, then that is equally absurd. And it is the absurdity of those aspects of the regulations 
which is undermining their credibility. And the third thing, which I think is undermining the stickability of these regulations, is whether or not there is the necessary proportionality between the regulations and the reality of the disease. Surely the proportionality for the restrictions that you bring in should be proportionate to the number of deaths and the number of hospital admissions, not to the number of cases. Happily, there are many people who are not happy that they're contacting, contracting COVID, but happy that it's not overly affecting them. There are many, many cases, but there are very few, relatively speaking, hospital admissions and happily even less deaths. Should the proportionality not be between the number of deaths, the number of people in our hospitals, remembering initially restrictions were to protect our health service, should the proportionality not be between the number of deaths and hospital admissions and the severity of restrictions, instead of the severity of the restrictions being with the number of cases. And that brings us to the issue when we hear all the statistics promulgated and we're told, oh, in so many weeks, there'll be so many cases. Are we getting the worst case scenario again? Remember, we got the worst case scenario six months ago, 15,000 dead. We were never told what the best case scenario was. And to date, we've worked out much closer to it than to the worst. Are we again getting the worst case scenario with concealment of the best case scenario? Because I'm not sure you can do that twice and hold public credibility. So I do think there has to be a particular focus on two things. I think those who are evidently vulnerable need that ring of steel of protection. And those who flagrantly breach the law need to find no mercy. Be it in the Holy Lands, be it in Healy Park, which I note the chairman of the Health Committee boasted of attending on Sunday. Talks about example and common sense. I'm not saying he was out in the middle of the pitch, but he was there. And then comes to this house telling us about leading. By example, certainly. Um, the member should check his facts before he comes into this house and makes assertions. I wasn't at the gate. But the member should the member should note that the GAA plays a fantastic contribution in our communities. And if the member takes a look at the Dungannon COVID response, he will see that Thomas Clark's club provided assistance to vulnerable people in our society right throughout the pandemic. The member says he wasn't there. Why then did he tweet? Colm Gilder knew. I didn't get a ticket for Healy Park today. Sorry. So decided to head to Dungannon Park instead. Sorry. My apology. Different place, but still at a public gathering. I was that sensible. Be a public park? I don't know what happened at Dungannon Park, but we certainly know we we certainly know what happened at Hewley Park. The member is very quick to defend the GAA. It was GAA supporters who 
gathered on the ground at Haley Park. It was GAA supporters, part of the outreach, I suppose, went into the pubs of Dungannon to sing IRA songs. Not much social distancing there. So I do make the point, though I misspoke about where, which park the member was at, I do make the point that if we're going to talk about personal responsibility and about leading by example, then that's exactly what we should do. And such should lead a member, such as Mr Gildenew, to be unequivocal in condemning the gathering on the pitch in Haley Park, the gathering in the pubs, the singing of the songs, the spreading of the virus. Would just a moment, please. Um, I know the member has repeatedly made uh, his concerns about that known, uh, so we don't have to rehearse it a number of times, OK? And I would prefer if the member just moved back to basically the regulations and discussion on those regulations. Mr. Story is going to bring me back in the yeah, yeah. Mr. Story. I thank the member for giving way. Will he add to that list so that we have a completeness? Because we've heard a lot of eulogies this morning about the fantastic work that the GAA have done in our own constituency, of both the Health Minister and Mr. Alistair and myself. We had the most disgraceful display in Dunloy when Dunloy uh, beat Loch Gill in Hurland. We had a band. The irony of having a band parade in Dunloy, which hadn't, thanks to confirmation from the Parades Commission, any notification on 11 bar 1. So not only do they flout the health laws in Dunloy in relation to the party that they had and it's on social media, but they also flouted the laws which in that very village they tell us you must keep the hypocrisy of the members opposite bears no resemblance to reality. It is shameful. And we'd ask the member maybe that represents the area to make some comment as well. I think Mr. Thoreau's point is well made. It, it, it cries out for an answer. I don't hear one. But the fundamental at the end of this is, in a society threatened, as we undoubtedly are, there has to be a bounden, compelling personal responsibility on every citizen. Every citizen is capable of catching the virus. Therefore, every citizen must take their own defences. And of course, those who don't threaten everyone. But I do think the Minister has an uphill battle, and it's an uphill battle of a homegrown variety within this executive. Homegrown by the Deputy First Minister, and homegrown with muddling regulations. Thank you. Here I'm sir, Jerry Carroll, Hunt Cash. I call Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, and since rushing to prematurely reopen the economy and force thousands of people back into work, uh, the political esta establishment here have engaged in the blame game that seeks to scapegoat ordinary people for the spread of COVID in order to, in my view, cover up for their own failures. Uh, recent changes seem to be um, at least uh, partially uh, about shifting blame for the spread of COVID away from the government and onto individuals' behaviour and the sphere of people's private lives. It reaches the point of absurdity, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, for example, uh, when MLAs are up in arms about uh, COVID spreading in homes with more than six people, by sim simultaneously they are forcing thousands of workers back to work and doing nothing about clusters spreading in workplaces. Where is the evidence uh, that COVID is spreading in living rooms, but not on shop floors or workplace canteens? Uh, I have repeated this question twice last week to the First Minister, who did not give a, a clear answer or provide the evidence. I am glad the Health Minister is here today, and I hope he can shed uh, some light uh, on that question. So the regulations essentially say, 
don't visit your grandparents, uh, but take them anywhere you want, as long as they, uh, there's a till to spend money. It's so farcical that it defies description. But such hypocrisy, Mr Deputy Speaker, is not only unfair, it is dangerous because it feeds the worst elements of scepticism about the health advice around COVID. The recent spread of the virus is a failure of this establishment, not of ordinary people. Precisely when we had infection rates down to controllable levels, this chamber lifted restrictions on workplaces and opened the door to a second wave. Indeed, since the onset of this crisis, ordinary people generally uh, have been ahead of the government. They forced the shutting of schools when ministers uh, refused to act, and other workplaces at the start of lockdown through public pressure. At times, workers walked off their jobs to protect themselves, uh, and the level of communal and community solidarity with workers and the vulnerable uh, has been remarkable throughout this crisis. But almost every day uh, since, we have seen examples where the hypocrisy of the government uh, towards the virus starkly uh, contrasts with the efforts of communities and frontline workers, because in the final instance, this government is about ultimately prioritising the needs of profit and capital over people's health, from people being told not to visit the family but get back to work to employers cramming workers back into unsafe working conditions, to poor people being forced to choose between poverty or risking their health, to financial provisions being stripped away from people, the elderly dying in care homes, to politicians fluting. Yeah, I'll give away, yeah. For giving way. I would just ask for clarity through uh, you, Mr Deputy Speaker, if the member is saying that, that he thinks that schools should not be open, that the economy should not be open, the health, should, health service should not be open, and that we should all stay at home and wait for this virus to pass. Um, Mr. Speaker, thanks for intervention. I didn't say the health service should shouldn't be open. It needs to be open to, to treat people. Workers are obviously have been working. The point I made uh, to the member, if she listened to what I said, was that uh, the health, uh, sorry, the education minister refused the act, and workers and parents were forced to act to protect people uh, from. Uh, the virus spread in schools. He failed the act and he was forced to do a U-turn. And since that, he's been forced to do about four or five U-turns since. That was my point. Um, and the, the hypocrisy, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is feeling the worst reactions against the health uh, advice. It is no accident, uh, Mr Speaker, that around the world, the far right is hitching itself to conspiracy theories around the threat of COVID from Trump in the US to the small but dangerous uh, fascist and far-right groups here in Ireland. And the question of masks is crucial here, because <clears throat> whilst the, the DUP members uh, in this uh, chamber may attack students for having parties, we have the likes of Sammy Wilson, a man who holds a PhD in political ignorance, dismissing our medical doctors and undermining the most basic health advice around masks. People like Sammy Wilson are a disgrace, and they're playing with fire and risking lives. Mr Speaker, should people uh, be made to wear masks in any and every circumstances? Of course not. However, I firmly believe that wearing a mask is an act of solidarity with my fellow human beings and that workers have a right to work as free as they can from the dangers of being affected by others. This includes bus drivers, retail workers, uh, buses, trains, shops, hospitals, or all someone's workplace. Thus, people may have a right not to wear a mask in an abstract, ontological, theoretical sense, and if they have underlying medical conditions as well, but they don't have a right to enter workplaces without one and put workers' health at risk. You can smoke to your heart's content, but you do not have the right to smoke in a confined workplace and possibly damage the health of others with second-hand smoke. This is not about the narrow confines of individual rights versus society. It is about class politics. Uh, so I would appeal to people, therefore, to respect workers and to wear a mask. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, Stormont and Westminster have so far failed to deal with this crisis, but working class solidarity and struggle and people coming together can help us to get through this crisis and build a better world after it. And just sorry, finally, final, finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would just echo the points made about the uh, notification uh, last week that we received that uh, Department of Health officials may not be able to attend uh, future briefings of the Health Committee. To me, that's a disgrace. Um, I think uh, when, when I ask questions and other members can speak for themselves around some of the SR, some of the changes. I think there is often detail that we do not get. We need more info. Uh, um, sometimes we get people who can answer questions. Sometimes we get people who do not or are unable to answer questions. So I think uh, if the Minister can address that concern and assure us that somebody from his department will be there to address the uh, changes to the regulations in the future, that would be helpful. Thank you. I call Steve Aiken.
Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Speaker. And I am rising, of course, obviously to support our Minister, because our Minister indeed has one of the most difficult jobs anywhere across these islands. And I think everybody could agree that he's been exemplary in how he's committed his duties. But let us go back nine months, where nine months at the beginning of this year, nobody apart from a few people in China knew that COVID was on its way and the implications of it was going to be. COVID is a pandemic. It is a completely unexpected event. And it is an event that had the potential to significantly disrupt the global system stop globalization and create enormous issues to do with health. And every single one of those things has come to pass. And the efforts that have been made and have needed to be made to be able to deal with this have been complex because nobody has had to deal with this in something like this in over a century. And the implications to everybody in Northern Ireland are huge. For those small businesses, those many small self-employed entrepreneurs who have got no access to the 53-odd million pounds that the economy minister has handed back to the finance minister. To those in schools who can't even understand from one day to the next what the particular rules and regulations are going to be and how they're going to do that. There is confusion out there. There is confusion out there because we're dealing with a situation that none of us have had to deal with before. And the purpose of what we're supposed to be doing, and indeed this was the purpose if we go back to the Belfast Agreement, and when we decided to re-establish democracy here in Northern Ireland and devolution in here in Northern Ireland, is that the people of Northern Ireland, through this Assembly and through this Executive, would take responsibility for our lives where we had to. And one of the most significant issues we have had to deal with is COVID. The health of our people is the most important thing that we all have to realise and support. But the health of our people needs to be taking a fully joined up approach. And a joined up approach across all of the executive ministries. We heard yesterday, Mr Deputy Speaker, in here when we were talking about the Holy Lands, we actually heard a justice minister who decided that she wasn't actually accountable or responsible for anything. We have seen a Deputy First Minister, and I'm not going to go on about this, but it must be said, a Deputy First Minister who has fundamentally undermined the message that we need to get across about following rules and regulations. There is one job for a leader, and that is to lead. That has been a massive failure in leadership to reach to that point. And the Executive Office. The Executive Office with two First Ministers, our First Minister and a Deputy First Minister, and two junior ministers, seem to be incapable of even doing the most basic administration and bringing these issues through to this House for us to be able to debate. Now, just because it has health in it, it seems to be that it seems to reside purely with the Health Minister with every issue. For those of us who have heard debates in here since we've come back in September, everything seems to be the Health Minister's responsibility. And I know we don't want to go back, or at least uh, we in the Ulster Unis Party would quite like to go back to running Northern Ireland again, but I'm pretty certain that everybody else in this Assembly wants to see all political parties working together to make the situation work. Yet everything seems to be headed in the direction of the Health Minister, when the reality is this is a responsibility for the Executive Office. Why then, if it wasn't responsibility for the exec or if it, if it wasn't the responsibility for the executive office, did the first minister and the deputy first minister decide to take the sound bites yesterday and presenting press conferences? And why do they appear on media? It seems to be if there is a situation where they want to get some gain from, they take it. But if there's something difficult or fundamentally unpopular, who do we give it to? We give it to the busiest person and the hardest working minister in this entirety of this executive. We give it to the health minister. And I can tell you right now, because I'm looking down at him, I know he's well up for the job. But that's not what should be done. The executive office and their two junior ministers, if they're not capable of even doing this, I think their combined salaries are £110,000 a year plus a bit of pension money. Maybe we should do a bit of saving and take that money and use it for something more appropriate, like supporting our health workers. Because if the executive officer are unable to deliver, 
What is going on? And I put this appeal out to every political party who has ministers sitting around the executive table. Get together. Get out there. Get the message out there. Because everybody says is sniping about, oh, this bit's confusing or that bit's confusing. What is confusing to the people who very shortly are going to go into ICU and are going to have tubes put down their throats? What is confusing to those elderly people who are now, like many of us with elderly relatives, are going now to be having to be shielding again and are raising concerns? What is the process that people who seem to be bright enough to be selected to go to universities in Northern Ireland can't even understand the basics of keeping socially distanced? Why is that the responsibility of the health minister and some other politicians? Why is that not the responsibility of the individual who should be bright enough to pass a GCSE, an AS level and an A level to get to university, who can't even be bothered to read the government website? We, as politicians, have a responsibility to make sure our message is clear. We have a responsibility as politicians to make sure that there is no confusion in the message. We, above all, as polish politicians, have the responsibility to show leadership. And we do need to tell those people out there who think they can flout the rules, who think somehow they are immune to COVID, that they are not. And I say again, if they're capable of going into an off-license and buying bottles of beer and then joining with other people, they're more than capable of actually reading the government regulations and for once stop putting themselves first and put the people of Northern Ireland first, which is indeed what our Health Minister has done. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I now call on the Minister for Health to wind on the debate on all five motions, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, and I welcome today's debate on the five regulations and everything else that was discussed as well. And can I thank the members for the contributions that they have made? Mr Deputy Speaker, we all want to see a return to a more normal way of living. But unfortunately, that has been disrupted once again with the recent increase in cases. As members will already be aware, our R rate is now above one. The transmission of the epidemic will increase, resulting in more cases, hospitalisations and deaths. The greater the value of R is above one, the more rapid the increase. It is predicted that it won't be long before we see pressure on our hospital system and an increase in deaths. Our seven-day incidence based solely on new positive cases is now at 53.4 per 100,000 people, or 14-day incidence 85.9. Community transmission remains widespread, associated with multiple small clusters rather than a small number of larger outbreaks. Unfortunately, it is still the case that much of the transmission is occurring between small social or family gatherings and casual mixing between households. As I have stated previously, I will not step back from wider or stronger restrictions should they be required. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will now take some of the points. Um, that members have made during the debate. I focus um, in particular on aspects relevant to the regulations, but also cover some of the, the wider um, contribution. Um, in his opening comments, the, the chair of the Health Committee um, acknowledged the five, five regulations that have been brought um, today. Can I thank the chair, his committee members, and the, the staff of the Health Committee for the level of work that they do in scrutinising and bringing forward these regulations? And I can provide the clearance, or the clearance that, that Mr. Carl was seeking in regards to what I'm led to believe that a, um, an official may, there will be officials available for the Health Committee and bring them forward any change in regulations. And I can give that commitment. I think it was a misunderstanding from the official that I don't want to be expanded because the, the officials who are working through these regulations are a small team within my department that have taken on an increasingly high level of work over the last number of months. And I think in, in his opening comments, he also acknowledged uh, the transition, and I think Mrs Bradshaw acknowledged it as well in regards to the change from our number one regulations to the number two regulations and what was prohibited rather than what was prescriptive 
and that was necessary because we had seen in a number of debates in regards to the regulations that the ever-increasing changing and amendments to the number one regulations was becoming so unwieldy it was right to take a complete rewrite and look at those. But the important thing is, Chair, or Mr Deputy Speaker, and I think it has been raised a number of times by contributors, these will only be in place as long as they are strictly necessary. At this minute in time, where we see uh, the increases in cases of coronavirus, they are necessary. And a number of members have made reference to the public consistent messaging. That, that is vital, Deputy Speaker. Uh, it has been raised numerous times in here, and I'll, co I'll, I'll comment later on, on a number of specifics that the members raised, but we do need that consistent, uh, clear message. We also need, I think, as the Chair raised, and as many members raised, in regards to compliance and enforcement. Because for these regulations to be credible, they need to be enforced. Now, that will mean um, actions being taken which will not be politically palatable to some in this House, will not be publicly palatable to many on our social media. But if we are to be serious about the enforcement of these regulations and the steps that we need to take, then those actions um, will need to happen. Um, Mr Gildan, you then spoke as, as spokesperson for, for Sinn Féin, uh, and I share with him um, his thoughts. Uh, there is not a normal way of doing business. That change, that's, that, that, that adaptation that we've seen across Northern Ireland in the past number of months um, is not something that we can go back to easily, or I don't think we'll go back to quickly either. But vitally, that reinforcement of our message that he gave, the message that all in this House um, should be sharing, no matter what you think of these regulations or the guidance that comes um, from my department. Social distancing, good respiratory hygiene, good hand hygiene, and wearing face coverings works. It worked for us to get us to where we were in the months of July and August. We were doing that collectively, and I want and I ask that we get back to that, that point now. Um, these regulations are to protect our loved ones, and that's where I come um, from the draft and from the delivery and from even standing here today in this House in support of them and, and moving them. Um, the Vice Chair of the Health Committee, uh, Mrs Cameron, um, reported and, or, and started her, her opening comments in regards to the importance of the return to school and that clear, very clear message of the school settings. But I think it's also crucial that we acknowledge the challenges um, that that has put in place in regards for all those who work through our education system, as much as our health system at this moment in time. The challenges that it has presented to patients, uh, sorry, to parents who have had that um, that challenge. Do, does their child need a test? Now, Mr. Sheehan's example um, was replicated across this country. That access to testing was not good enough. We've been working on work, still continue to work to make that better. But I think in his experience um, and the example that he gave to this house shows the importance of our health service and supporting parents and getting back their children back to school because we all know the, the importance of, of education. In regards to this, the specific uh, questions in, in regards to, to bubbles, um, what is permitted is bubbling with one other household, and these are households of any size, as long as those in the house only make that maximum number of six. So that is permissible. It is a restriction. It is a restriction on the way that we want to interact. And it goes back to that challenge, the narrative that says we can't meet in our house, but we can meet in a pub. Mr Deputy Speaker, when we bubble and support those who need care, who need childcare facilities, it can be done but it must be done responsibly. But what I would say clear for, for those families who do bubble, you can only be in one bubble. So you cannot be in multiple bubbles. So it's when you come together to form that one unit for support, for should it be for healthcare or childcare, that it must be done with consideration and care for the entirety of who is in that bubble. The way to Mr. Alistair. I think it is important that there's absolute clarity about this and grateful. So is the minister saying that the bubbling from six o'clock is 
exclusively for the purpose of giving support. It's not bubbling just because you want to visit the person. Is that right? I well, thank the member. And, and the guidance is on, the, on NI Direct, and it has been since we brought in the first restrictions. There's bubbling with one other household. And these are for care and responsibilities, including childcare uh, and support services as well. So it's not just for social interaction, because that's where we're seeing the spread um, of, of this virus at this moment in time. And what I will say, it has been said before, and I think the first time I brought these regulations, it was I that brought them, as, and I said they were draconian. Mr Alistair gave us a history of le lesson of who Draco was. I don't want these regulations to be in that place. These are for a short, specific period of time. We don't know how long it will be, but I sincerely hope it is not for the period of time that the first regulations were in. We have seen the introduction of, of these regulations, and, and what these regs actually covered was the introduction of the first postcode area, when we thought there was an opportunity we could have managed it by that process. What we actually have seen in the past number of days um, is that area, of BT43 in Ballymena, the area that the member the number of members in this House that represent actually started to see a small decrease in the number of cases. So we can see that these actions work. What we also seen, unfortunately, was a spread of positive cases across the entirety of Northern Ireland that meant that that specific uh, geographical restriction was no longer um, of, of benefit. Um, and again, I, uh, Ms Cameron also referred to um, the enforcement and the compliance with these regulations. And it's something that has been repeated across this House. And that's why I thought, and that's why I was fully supportive of the establishment of that executive group on compliance um, and enforcement. So far, it's met twice, but solely focused on what has happened in the Holy Lands. That remit needs to be wider now, because we relied so much on the goodwill of the people of Northern Ireland in, re in enforcing and respecting the first set of regulations. I think they need to see that we're willing to step up and take those compliance and enforcement regulations and bring in um, the weight of the law that is, that is behind them. Uh, Mr Colin McGrath um, uh, raised the, the need for, for the executive approach being united. Um, I couldn't agree more. It makes my job so much easier. Um, at times, so much more challenging, because we are in that unique situation where we have a five-party five party executive. So will there be confusion? Will there be uh, complications? Yes, it's in the nature of our politic. I can't afford, as Health Minister, to allow that politic or that confusion to take over the message that comes from our public health agency, our health care sector and our health workers, because that message to me is vital and paramount. So when it comes to the messaging. And he was the first member to stand up here and say how, how confusing this message is. What I will say to those members of this House who go down that line, um, look for the answers. Search NI Direct. I think it was Mr Butler actually said he's not in the chamber at the moment. But when those questions come into his constituency, office, he went and sought the answers and got them back. When you go through NI Direct and go through the question and answer session that's there, that to me is part of a public representative job is to explain that message, because these aren't easy messages to give out. Our first message was easy. Stay at home. That was the easiest message to convey to everyone at one time. But what we've seen now, and I suppose it becomes more in our more nuanced um, response to COVID-19, where we do look for the exceptions, where we do look for the clarity, where we do look to provide um, additional freedoms to those who, who, who need them, but also additional restrictions for those who need to be enforced as well. So that is why this set of regulations and the set that was, will be under just from 6 p.m. tonight is simple in what it wants to do. But when we start to get the multiple questions, does this mean I can do this? Does that mean it takes a period of time to go through all those multiple layers of what the precise implications are? We don't have the team that are sitting in other Deval or other national governments sitting going through these regulations, but these regulations have the same requirement and the same purpose at heart, and that is about saving the lives of the people of Northern Ireland. Good
Minister, and again, I think that we're all coming from the same perspective on this, but again, having the opportunity here to ask those questions would be critical, because the answer that you've just given to Jim, uh, Mr Alistair, contradicts what's on the NI Direct website, where it says that you can have a social bubble, and then the next line, you can go into houses for the purposes of childcare, and that that's not one and the same thing, and that those are the type of information that we need to tease out, because those are the questions that the public read and get confused, and that it is good to talk. And if we are in this room and can ask the question, if you can't, then your officials will know exactly the question that we're going to be sending in to you by email at the end of the meeting, which would be worthwhile. Social bubbles, for the sake of social bubbles, we're defeating the purpose of what we're trying to do now at this point in time, and that's to, to prevent the spread of, of the virus. When we look at the, what we're trying to do now, this vi virus do doesn't spread itself. We spread it. So the number of interactions that we have in a day increases the possibility of this virus to spread. So if we all take time and think where we're going to be in the next seven days, next 14 days, and actually cut down those number of interactions, we cut down the opportunity for this virus to spread. That's what these regulations are about. Um, and it's about, you know, it's about that support, um, and again I'll repeat this, for our loved ones, for our families, but also for the health care, for the health care workers. Um, but one of the things, and then I'll say, sorry, one of the things I want to say to the, the members as well when they use this message of being confused, and it goes back, I think, I think to, to the point that Mr. Butler made as well. You know, let's be careful that either we as politicians, when we're commentating, or our media at times when they're commentating about people being confused, that we don't actually insult the general public of Northern Ireland. Because when the general public of Northern Ireland see many of this message and, and hear many of these messages, for some, they understand it. For the most, they understand it. For the most, they actually comply with it. That's why we were able to get where we did back in July and August. Um, so, and again, and in regards to, to, to Mr. Butler's contribution, I, I do um, thank him for, for his support as well. Um, uh, and I think it was Mr. Sheehan come in uh, on, an, on an intervention and said about, you know, that. It was good to see you know, the Ulster Unionist Party circling their wagons um, around me. Uh, trust me, I was leader for two years. It wasn't always so, Pat. <laughs> um, I'll move on. Um, it goes quickly. Uh, move on to, to Ms. Br Mrs Bradshaw's uh, contribution, because um, I, I think in the con commentary yesterday, I do share our concerns around the, the risks associated with student households and those multiple occupancy households. You know, I, I, I've said this. I, I'm as disappointed that our students uh, have ignored all of the health messages by holding house parties in, in Belfast and the Olenans, but I don't think they represent young people across Northern Ireland who have made sacrifices themselves uh, to protect their families. And friends, because the scenes of Swiftless and the Holy Lands demanded swift and coordinated action by the relevant authorities and the City Council and the universities. And I'm glad that the PSNI have moved in and started to take those actions, because I think it was the, the point that Mr. Aiken, Aiken um, made as well um, that it is necessary for, for those people to realise the implications that their actions do have. But I don't want young people to be the scapegoat, scapegoats for the increase in COVID-19 uh, in Northern Ireland. I think that's why I also welcome the establishment of the executive working group um, to tackle um, the enforcement um, and the, the enforcement of these regulations to ensure compliance. Um, and again, I, I think I'm back then um, to, to Mr. Sheehan's comments. Um, I apologise, Pat, for what you had to go through and what your family had to go through. I have apologised, you know, and I apologise to all those families across Northern Ireland who found themselves in that similar situation when it came to testing, because testing is at the forefront of how we defeat this virus and how we arrest um, that second challenge. We've been working um, with our colleagues in DHSC in regards to that specific about postcodes, so I'm surprised to hear from the new one we were told that that has been sorted because it was all to do with postcodes and closest testing unit. So that's why we were always seeing people down the east of the province 
when Southeastern an hour because the computer said that was the closest test in sight without realising there was a, a body of water in between. My Welsh colleague Von Gethin was saying in the same when people from Wales were being sent across the Bristol Channel because the computer, I, I was assured that that had been addressed, but, but I, I, I picked up on, on, on that as well. In regards to uh, the opportunity for, for the exploration with, with community pharmacy, one of the things that I, I, I do want to take uh, time today as well, um, Deputy Speaker, is just to commend the work across our health and social care system, but also for community pharmacy uh, and those people who stepped up uh, during the height of the pandemic about making sure there was a supply, there was access to medication and delivery of prescriptions because they did go, they did go the extra mile for, for many small um, local communities as well. Um, Earlier, uh, Flynn talked you know, about the, the face coverings. Earlier, while we've been in here, um, I've, I've got guidance from our Chief Scientific Advisor. Uh, face covering means a uh, covering of any type which covers a person's nose and mouth. So a face shield may be used as a face covering. However, we advise that the use of cloth face coverings as they provide better protection from the risk of COVID, the COVID-19 virus. So those face, the face shields may be used and are recognised under this regulation. So again, come back to... Minister, I'm sorry, Mr. I'm Gross. going to have to interrupt you. Um, the Business Committee has arranged to meet at 1pm today, so therefore I propose by leave of the Assembly to suspend the sitting until 2pm. The first item of business when we return will be question time. This debate and the questions on the motions will resume following the urgent oral question. So... That's the business concluded until 2 p.m. Thank you. Okay, members, if members please take their seats and we'll now resume the debate on the health protection regulations and I call on the Minister of Health to continue with his response and wind. Um, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And if you missed the highlights from the last, I'm sure you'll catch up on Hansard and the urgent oral there. I'll try not uh, to repeat any answers that I've, I've already given in regards to, to this morning's debate, because this is a, a, serious, um, a, a serious issue that we are, are debating, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I think when responding to members, I, I, I could round to uh, Justin McNulty, um, and who, who signalled that concern that we've been echoing for quite some time, and that is of, of complacency. And we saw that throughout the summer's months, when the weather was good, when there was low cases, when there was very few people in the hospital, that the, the almost feeling was that we were through the worst of this, um, started to set in. And at that stage, um, it was an easy message to understand. It was an easy position to accept, but it was the wrong one because we now, we, we now know that we are, we are where we are. Um, and I think the importance that, that Mr McNulty re, uh, repair, or referred to was that importance of community effort as well, because we have relied um, on community groups um, throughout this pandemic. Um, and I think then moving on, uh, Pat Catney referred to the mental health challenges um, that we do see out there, and, and, the, uh, and we know um, the challenges that we have faced and the challenges that will come um, post this pandemic as well. And it's something, um, it's something that the Health Committee has kept bringing uh, back to the table. And I know Orlea Orle Flynn, from, from the very start, uh, when we started to speak about the pandemic, sought that reassurance that our mental health action plan and mental health strategy was still on course. It, ha it is still on course. We have added COVID-specific detail to it and also in the appointment of our interim mental health champion as well, who is doing sterling work um, across, the, across the sector at this point in time. Um, Alan Chambers um, spoke about the need of a, a common sense approach. If common sense was in the abundance that we didn't need these regulations, I would be assured and I'd be more than glad that that's the approach um, that we could take and should take, unfortunately. Um, it's not, and we're seeing, the, and we're seeing the, the outfalling of that in a very small, a very small minority across Northern Ireland. But those actions have repercussions, where people think it's okay to do that, or we also see um, the spread um, of the virus. He, he also referred um, to one notable, I think, 
musician um, from Northern Ireland who has made um, some interactions. And, um, you know, to paraphrase, these regulations are about bringing us from the dark end of the street to the bright end of the road. It is not an easy move to make, and that is why we are asking the people of Northern Ireland to stick with the message that the health professionals um, actually give. Um, moving on then, um, Mr Allister um, referred to the challenges um, that it comes in, in delivering a message, uh, and, and I think he was right, because after six months this message is not, it's not easy to keep giving. It is not easy to keep hearing, but it is one that I need to keep giving and one that people need to keep hearing, because we are seeing the increases um, in, in cases. He spoke, um, he spoke rightly so of the proportionality, um, and I think just to, to realign that focus um, on cases, when we see the increase of cases that leads to the increase of hospitalisations, that leads to the increase of intensive care units uh, and or people in intensive care beds, that in leads to the increase in number of deaths. That is what propo is proportional, I believe, about the regulations that we are currently bringing in. We have 33 people in hospital today, five people in ICU. I want to arrest that increase now. We are doing that by the advanced testing, so we are seeing more cases, but it is about the translation um, across from positive cases to hospitalisation to ICU, uh, and there is, uh, and as I referred to Mr. East, uh, to, to Alec earlier on in regard to that two to, to four week, to four week lag. So there are. Limited restriction is about suppressing the spread of the virus. But how and when do you ever get off this roundabout? Is this virus going to die out? Are we going to have to wait for a vaccine? Or does there come a point when we face the fact that we're going to have to live with a virus which, frankly, isn't adversely affecting the greater number, but certainly is serious for some, but not in the proportions of the past? You know, and, and I think, you know, and I know where the member's line of questioning comes from, but it's not about, um, you know, and the member says it for the greater number, but it's for that small number that my duty is to protect. I think it's our executive's duty to protect. I think it's the reasonable steps that this House should take uh, to protect as well. He talks about the roundabout. If I knew when this was finished, I wouldn't be in here, I'd be. I'd be somewhere else making an awful lot more money uh, and doing a lot more, more, more different work. Because what, what we are seeing uh, in the development of vaccines in regards to where we were with seasonal flu and seasonal flu vaccines and the importance of that, this is, uh, and, and I think it's about that six month period of how we manage um, to live with this virus. And I think that's, that's the important phrase that often gets lost uh, when people hear, hear it. We live with this virus by bringing in regulations like these to prevent the spread of it, so more, so more people get the opportunity to live. And that's, that's where the, the challenge comes with the messaging. And he was right on that. But there's also, and he did highlight the challenges that come with the five party executive. Um, it's not all plain sailing, but there's one thing, um, you know, one thing that I. I'm reassured of that the message is that we do what uh, we can to save lives and bring in these regulations and the support packages. I wish the actions matched um, those messages as well, and that that debate has been had, and it's not something that that, that needs to be needs to be expanded on. Uh, in regards to uh, Mr. Carl um, and, and his contribution. Um, Jerry, I fully support your call for solidarity and the wearing of face coverings. I, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with the, the advantages and the benefits that it brings for those who can wear face coverings um, should be wearing face coverings, because we know and have seen the difference that it can, can make. Um, in regards to um, 
In regards to, to, to Mr Egham's comments about the small minority, um, unfortunately these regulations, the enforcement and the, the compliance is about making sure those in that small minority actually, actually adhere to the message that we need to, to do. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, in, in, in winding uh, and in concluding, uh, there has been much said about communications uh, on messaging, and many speakers have emphasised the need for clarity of messaging. And I agree, it is very important that we are careful not to create confusion. However, it is important that everyone appreciates that we are responding to a very rapidly changing and dynamic situation. We have measured a significant increase in positive cases in the last week, and rapid changes in policy are required to address this increasing risk. Um, to the health uh, of the public. In regards to, to some specific question, I think it was the, the Chair of the Committee raised, discussions are taking place on a regular basis uh, between the Four Nations and the UK on a range of matters, including the communi communication of public health information. Our overall messages um, should be aligned and consistent. These are regular, the hand washing, social distancing and the wearing of face coverings. The Executive has set out uh, its own roadmap to recovery and renewal and decisions on the unfolding local context are based on medical and scientific advice. Uh, the Executive Office will deploy a high-impact public information campaign using television, radio, print and digital platforms to ensure people in Northern Ireland understand how to, to stay um, and, and also to, to save lives. I think it was the, the Chair of the Committee asked about, about the funding of that within my department. That money actually rests within the Executive uh, Office Department for that communication side uh, through the Executive Info Information Services. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, in, in concluding that, um, I hope I have answered as many um, of the members' queries and questions in regards to the five regulations that we brought forward, but also as part of the urgent oral that was part of and fitted well, I think, into this debate. So I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you, Minister. Um, the question now is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Regulations NI 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is approved. Um, we will now move on to the second motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister of Health to move the motion. Uh, thank you. I know the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Regulations, NI 2020, be approved. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it, and the, the motion is approved. Uh, we will now move on to the third motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you, and I call the Minister of Health to move the motion. Moved. Thanks, Minister. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Wearing of Face Coverings Amendment Regulations, NI 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. Okay, the ayes have it, and the motion is approved. Uh, we will now move on to the fourth motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister of Health to move the motion. Moved. Thanks, Minister. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Amendment Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is approved. We will now move on to the fifth motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the clerk to read the motion, please. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 2, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I call the Minister of Health to move the motion. Moved. Thank you, Minister. 
The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 2, Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it, and the motion is approved. And that concludes this item of business. Just